The time being 7.01, I will call to order the regular meeting of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board to order. If uh, the Secretary Ringgold, you would please take the roll. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Cogill. Here. Commissioner Severson. Here. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Commissioner French. Here. Commissioner Forney. Here. Vice President Hassan. Here. President Born. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. I would entertain a motion for uh, to pr approve the agenda. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor of the agenda for September 12th signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The uh, motion carries. Uh, I would take a motion for the, do we, uh, Secretary Ringel, do we, we do not have minutes to approve this evening? We do not. Okay, I would uh, move directly to reports of officers, uh, Superintendent Merrill. Thank you, President Bourne. I wanted to um, first and foremost remind everybody that the Minneapolis Bike Tour is this Sunday, 7.30 a.m. at Boom Island. It, um, I think it's gonna be a great event. So those of you who are bikers, um, please come out. Uh, there's a 16 mile loop, there's a 13 mile uh, loop, and a 32 mile loop, excuse me. And, uh, or if you just wanna come and cheer the folks on, come on down, it promises to be a very good time with a little bit of fun, even planned for after uh, the bike tour. I know uh, Commissioner uh, Meg Forney is gonna be there. Okay. Yes, yeah, Commissioner so Stephanie Musich Mus 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 is going to be there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner John O. Cogill is going to be there. Commissioner Chris Meyer is going to be there. So, ooh, ooh, ooh. So you know it's going to be there. <laughs> 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 I really hope so. Okay. You mean as we go out? Good, good. So please come out. It's going to be a great time. All right, um, staff have begun to winterize the uh, waiting pools and are really trying very hard to maintain bathrooms that support our athletic fields. Um, nearly $500,000 worth of sidewalk work touching 25 parks across our system. So we're nearing completion of that and so that's really, that's really exciting. I hope they got the places that I, I was a little concerned about. Um, Environmental management, starting on Monday, this coming Monday, September 17th, the boat launches at Bade Makaska, Lake Harriet, and Lake Nokomis <coughs> will close at 9 p.m. So you'll need to be off the lake around 9 p.m. in terms of the boat launch issue. Um, launches will be open and staffed by NPRB aquatic invasive, invasive species watercraft inspectors from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days per week. So we're gonna make sure that we keep those invasive species to a minimum. Since the uh, launch is opened on May 1st, NPRB watercraft inspectors have conducted 5,687 inspections. Additionally, the inspectors have conducted 13,732 non-voter interactions. Through the end of August, AIS inspectors reported 127 AIS violations at the boat launches, including 10 occurrences of zebra mussels on watercraft and 59 occurrences of aquatic plants on watercraft. So um, we, you know, we, we've got work to, still to do in that area. Um, this past Saturday, the 10th annual Minneapolis Monarch Festival attracted an estimated 10,000 participants. So I know they had a great time. I hope people took pictures, got great pictures of the butterflies. People of all ages learned um, again about the monarchs and they listened and danced to music, made art and did much more. So um, again, look for those pictures on our Facebook page. Um, later this week, forestry crews, so if you're there, will be working extensively along Theodore Worth Parkway from I-394 to Olson Highway. Um, and this work will focus on clearing the vegetation from the edge of the road, removing undergrowth along trails, and cutting grapevines that are harming pine trees. So that concludes 
my reports of offices. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Merrill. Mm -hmm. uh, do commissioners have any questions of the superintendent? Commissioner Musich. Mm -hmm. Thank you, President Bourne. Uh, superintendent Merrill, in past years, we had a number for voters to call if they were on the lake after we were staffing, but prior to the park itself closing. Is that not the case for this year? I'm sorry. The parks close at 10, we only staff till 9. If we've got people that are out boating until 10 p.m., is there a number posted that they can call to ask for assistance getting off the water at the launch? Or have we discontinued that practice for this year? Um, actually, I don't have a good answer for you, but I will get one. Okay, I'm, thank I'm you. not sure. Okay. Are there any other questions for the superintendent? Uh, seeing none, we will move on. I would entertain a motion for uh, the consent agenda resolutions. 2018-283 through 2018-285. Is there a motion? It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. The, uh, the uh, consent agenda has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, seeing no discussion on 2018-283 through 2018-285. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The consent agenda carries. Moving on to reports of standing committees. Chair Severson. Uh, I move that the board adopt resolution 2018-272, captioned as follows, res uh, resolution approving the request community advisory committee's CACs, programmatic priority areas as guidance for phase three of the request project. Second. It's been moved. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, Council Rice? Uh, Mr. Chair, if you could uh, call me after this matter passes. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion on uh, the resolution from the Recreation Committee, 2018-272, uh, seeing none? All of those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. Um, Council Rice, are you, looking, are you looking to speak to the next motion? I'm in lead, uh, looking to speak to the prior motion at uh, Resolution 2018-285. I just wanted to provide the board some information. Uh, Council Rice. Thank you, Mr. President. This concerns uh, the last item under the consent item, uh, Resolution 218-285. Um, the board should, we recommended uh, that the board should, and the board did approve this. I just want to give the board the heads up there. There has been a lawsuit that was filed by a unsuccessful bidder in this matter. Um, the uh, city of Minneapolis turned down that uh, bidder for failure, failure to meet certain uh, civil rights requirements. Um, but I, there is pending litigation, but in our opinion, that litigation should not affect uh, the award of this bid. But I, I felt that it was uh, important that you, the board, at least know about it. It involved a company called G, Gerb G Urban. Um, that uh, did not meet the re bidding requirements of the city for uh, minority and women uh, business-owned enterprises. Um, it, should that uh, litigation be successful, we don't think it would be. If it was successful, the only remedy this bidder would have would be for the cost of preparing their bid. But I do want the board to be aware of that moving forward. Thank you. I uh, think we did that this with staff coming forward. I probably should have had that uh, advice given to you before. Or you voted on it so you could be fully informed but thank you council rice your report is received and uh, just for clarification your report does not change the staff recommendations that that it be passed that's correct um, if there are any commissioners that are uncomfortable with the vote that they just took I would entertain a motion right now for to reconsider uh, 2018 285 not seeing any motion so we'll move on with uh, we will move on with the agenda thank you for the report uh, council rice um, moving on to the Planning Committee, uh, Chair Forney. On behalf of the Planning Committee, I'd like to move Resolution 2018-276, resolution concurring with the Federal Transit Authority's finding of a temporary occupancy exemption under Section 4F of the Transportation Act of 1966 for the D-Line Bus Rapid Transit Project on Todd Park and PV Park contingent on MPRB's continued involvement in the ongoing design of the project and on full implement implementation of mitigation efforts identified in the finding. Thank you. Uh, the motion has been moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all of those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. Chair Forney. 
I'd like to move resolution 2018-275, a resolution approving memorandum of understanding between Wall Development Company, Mississippi Watershed Management Organization, and Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board to explore options of the tower side green space model for ownership, development, and management. Thank you. The, the, the motion has been moved. Is there a second? Second. If it's been moved and seconded, is there any discussion on 2018-275? Seeing none, all of those in favor of 2018-275, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. Uh, Chair Cogill. On behalf of the Administration and Finance Committee, I'll move uh, Resolution 2018-225, a resolution authorizing the formation in charge of a Park Police Advisory Council. Uh, the motion 2018-225 has been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on 2018-225? Seeing none, um, I would just say I want to thank Chief Ohato for his work on this. This was a significant uh, portion of his work plan for uh, for this year, and I want to thank uh, Chair uh, Kogel and the superintendent and the other staff that had helped work on it and had taken some feedback from community members after the city came forward the last time and had come <coughs> really taken that feedback earnestly and had come back and made made, uh, made some revisions. So uh, thank you, Chief, for your work. Uh, seeing no further discussion of 2018 to 25, all of those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries unanimously. Chair Cogill. Um, I would like to move resolution 2018-227, resolution approving lease agreement with Kyle Malkerson, leasing commercial space at 3104 Pacific Street North, unit 200K, located within above the Falls Regional Park for a term of one year, effective September the 15th, 2018. Thank you. The motion has been moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. I'd like to correct the uh, resolution number to 2018-277. Thank you. Uh, no it has been 2018 to 77 has been uh, moved and seconded. Is there, is there any discussion on 2018 to 77? Uh, seeing none, I would ask the secretary to please take the roll. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Hassan. Aye. President Bourne. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. Uh, the motion carries. Uh, Chair Cogill. I will move resolution 2018-279, a resolution approving a use agreement with Marketing Minneapolis LLC to operate the skating rink at Loring Park beginning on October 1st, 2018. Uh, the motion has been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion on 2018-279? Uh, seeing none, I would just ask council's advice on 2018-279 as a use agreement. I don't believe that this requires a, a roll call. It does not. Okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favor of 2018-279, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? 2018-279 uh, carries. Uh, we are... Uh, moving into unfinished business, item 9.1 is a discussion on the uh, Upper Harbor Terminal, and we have Kate and Adam here to uh, give us an update. It's on. Is that showing up for you? Uh, not, uh, yes, yes. It's on in both spots. Okay. All right, thank you, commissioners. So I'm here tonight to give you a quick update on the Upper Harbor Terminal, but the main purpose is that we staff have some questions for you regarding funding for the Upper Harbor Terminal. So since I, it's a very complicated project, we probably really can't give you a full update. I would need to have the entire team here, including the city and the developers and everything. And so um, because it's up for engagement right now, you may be getting some questions and things from community members. So I wanted to give you kind of a snapshot of where we are in the process and a quick overview of what you might be seeing and hearing. But I would suggest that if you want to dive deeper into the project, that we could arrange a time where you could have a much more in-depth um, update and ask us kind of much more in-depth questions as we're working through the community process at the same time. So, so um, first of all, I just wanted to note kind of where we are. The Upper Harbor Terminal, is, as you know, if you have a long history, has been a site that has been in question for decades. And now the city, the park board, and the master developer are moving forward with a um, 
have been moving forward with a planning process. And in August, we released a draft concept, and we um, kind of initiated engagement specifically on that concept. Uh, right now, um, we've had three, four uh, public meetings, quite a number of focus groups, open hours, and things like that. We're in the midst of scheduling our second round of um, engagement to kind of do some more small group work and dive deeper in. Um, but right now, we have wanted to give you an update on just this process as it's being rolled out to the public and then also get your feedback on, on some of our funding questions. Um, we don't know how long it will take us to work through to get to a concept that we feel has general approval. You know, we were hoping maybe by the end of the year, but we are, we'll have to see how the engagement goes to know how long that process is going to take. And then, you know, the next couple of years, we would continue to develop that concept, um, start to look at redevelopment improvements, and then possibly initial site improvements might begin here in the next two to three years. So if you're familiar with the site, and I'm going to fly very quick, quickly through this, but I wanted to, for you to see just kind of a sample of what's out there in the public. If you're familiar with the site, it is 48 acres um, in North Minneapolis on the Mississippi River between the freeway and the park board and um, south of our North Mississippi Regional Park and just north of Lowry Bridge, about a mile long. It's a very industrial site, so if you've seen the domes, you know that there's a lot of industrial infrastructure. There is no park now there now. Even though barges are not coming up there anymore, it is still being operated by the city temporarily as an industrial site until its kind of future is a little bit more known and they can take the next steps towards redevelopment. So um, the Upper Harbor Terminal, while it's large at 48 acres, it's really part of a much larger um, riverfront, and so we just want to put it in context that the kind of the... The issues that we're wrestling with on the Upper Harbor Terminal are part of the entire Upper Riverfront in both North Minneapolis and Northeast, where we are trying to finish the job of providing park space and green space and um, public access to the river and to the water in communities that have never historically had access to this. So the process that we're working through right now um, really started in a lot of ways back in 2011, where the Park Board had their River First initiative, did a lot of engagement around that. The city and the Park Board followed up with Above the Falls regional park plans and um, master plan updates. But these, the engagement for this was um, done for kind of that whole upper river as a whole. And so when we really started focusing in on the upper harbor terminal, it was more in, in 2015 um, with the end of barging. So we went through a process where we felt we really needed market insight, and the city and the park board wanted to collaborate rather than kind of arbitrarily splitting, splitting the process. We felt that we were going to maximize both the park and the development potential and get the most out of what community members wanted if we worked together. We needed market insight. We needed to understand you know, what the possibilities were for this really challenging site. So we sought a partner, not a plan, and we can, um, are currently working with the one team that submitted, Thor Companies, United Properties, and First Avenue Productions. And then with kind of the introduction of that development team, we kicked off engagement in 2017 um, and did a lot of more robust engagement. This time, it was still fairly general, asking people what they wanted to see happen here, um, responding to some basic kind of general ideas that we'd heard so far, but it was now focusing in more on the Upper Harbor Terminal as opposed to kind of the entire Upper Riverfront. So there's a lot of more information about that engagement online. We could do a whole hour on just the engagement, but I won't go into all of the details now. Um, basically, the team took what we heard and tried to craft it and balance it into a concept. And so that is the draft concept that um, we're showing now. So this would be a multi-phase development, starting with a dowling. We're looking at about 15 and a half acres of public park space. And when I go through this, I'm not going to try to really present the developer's concept for them, because I couldn't do it complete justice um, in the time that we have tonight. But I will probably go into a little more depth on the park and kind of the imp impacts for us. So we are looking at phasing since Dowling is the current only access right now to the site, then that would kind of naturally be the place that it would start. Um, so the first phase is kind of that northern half of the site. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on some of these as we go through. The second phase would fill in, again, around that northern portion of the site. That's what you see in purple here. The third phase. Um, is a little bit more in question. That's the sort of teal areas at the bottom that's um, impacted by some of the surrounding uses, including GAF. And so we do have some questions for uh, community members as we go through this on you know, how and when they might like to see that third phase develop. Um, but that is probably the part that is a little bit in question because we, it's going to be impacted by what happens on the first two phases as well. So one of the things that you've probably heard about is the idea of a large performing arts venue on the riverfront. And this was an idea that the development team um, has come in with from the beginning. This was something that you know early engagement 
uh, told us that people really liked the idea of music, said that that would bring them to the riverfront, but music on the riverfront can take a lot of forms, a lot of scales and things, and so we needed to dig deeper into this question and find out you know, what exactly did people mean and was kind of this vision that was shaping up, was that fitting um, with what we'd heard. One of the things is, as we go through this, the um, development team and, and the city and the park board as well have tried to really articulate kind of how this concept responds to uh, questions and concerns and wishes that we heard from community members, and some of that gets a little bit more into specifics of, you know, what kind of benefits do we see coming out of these, these different initiatives that go on here. So the, I'll show some pictures of it in just a second, but one of the things that we try to do is put things in scale for people. So the, the performing arts venue that First Avenue Productions is looking at here, um, we try to put it in scale with some of the other you know, large event and, and music venues in the area. So you can see that it is larger than some of the existing outdoor ones, but um, quite a bit smaller than a lot of the, the really big stadiums and things. And then um, they articulated uh, where the funding would be coming from, which is a portion uh, they're going to be seeking a state bond request in the future that the city would sponsor, capital campaign, um, input from First Avenue, and, and other possible sources. And also got fairly detailed about kind of how the seating would work and things, because they wanted to have enough detail that people could really respond to this concept. So this shows, you've probably seen these pictures out a little bit, shows um, their basic concept, which is the music venue on the riverfront. And they were trying to avoid kind of a, a more traditional music venue that is often empty when it is not being actively programmed, but to create something that they could operate as kind of publicly available green space um, and could be used for a variety of scales, not just large performances, but also kind of smaller performances or other events happening in this space. And these show some of the pictures that, that they put out to show how they are consolidating seating in what they call kind of the gantry scheme to minimize the amount of footprint and maximize the availability of kind of just general green space on the river. Um, and they are looking for options for ways that they can accommodate um, small performances because they heard that that was a desire from the community as we did. Um, previous engagement. And they have put together and articulated a community benefits package, which I won't go into now, but looking at how employment could work, public programming, and, and things like that, so that people um, can really respond to something a little bit more specific as they're looking at this concept. One of the things is that they're looking at a per ticket fee that comes in with all of the ticketed or paid events for this that then go back and support community programming around 65 days of the year. And then that would also support maintenance of the facility to keep it open another 250 days a year so that it's available to the public when it's not being closed off for ticketed events. The phase one development um, primarily, oops. primarily led by Thor and United Properties, you know, again, is focused on Dowling. They're looking at quite a different um, mix of uses. Uh, they're mainly looking at uh, housing and office, both over retail, because they want to activate that ground floor and kind of create as strong a public realm as possible. Also a possible hotel over retail and something called the Community Innovation Hub, which is kind of a community-led area that they're setting aside to hopefully um, develop as incubator space, health and wellness space, and kind of work with community partners to create sort of a community-led vision and implement it there. So they're um, articulating what kind of affordable housing they can feel that they can provide on this site, at least based on the current development numbers, what kind of jobs, kind of how large these buildings are, how many stories, most of them are around five to seven stories, so that people can have an idea of actually kind of what uses might go in here beyond just sort of the basic land use plan. And some of these graphics get a little bit more into how parking would work, how many square feet would be devoted to each use. Um, and they're also looking hard at affordable housing, as we've heard that this is a lot of concern and question among the community. And so noting, you know, what percentages they think they can reach, but also um, try to, trying to put that into the language of what the average income is in North Minneapolis, not just for the metro area, so that um, they can give ideas of how much, for example, a one bedroom versus a three bedroom or something might cost in the affordable units. So these are all ongoing conversations. So I'm going through the details really very quickly, but if you have questions about it, this is exactly the kind of detail that we can get into, into more. So in just the Community Innovation Hub a little bit more, this is something that is very much in flux. People are starting to kind of envision what could be here, and there, there are some ideas that are starting to take shape, but it hasn't been decided yet by any means. 
So the park space on this, um, which is shown in green on here, we are looking at 15 and a half acres of public park, definitely all along the riverfront where we have consistent um, pedestrian and bicycle access with a trail, and then the parkway on here, which I'll show in a minute, and a couple of um, more what we call meaningful park spaces, which is park spaces that are kind of beyond linear connections, which is what a lot of this, this property is. Um, we're also trying to put our information into scale so that people can relate it back to familiar spaces. So compared to other Northside park spaces, you know, you can see that the meaningful park spaces we're talking about, one right at the end of Dowling, one a little bit further south, um, you know, are respectively a little less than an acre and about 2.3 acres. And then we're looking at about 12 and a half acres of more of the linear riverfront park space that adds up to the 15 and a half. So one of our goals on this was to get people as quickly as possible into public green space on the river. And since Dowling is the main access, um, this last block of Dowling um, right now in this concept is shown as a pedestrian area so that uh, there's not vehicles on this portion, but this is not only just a, a circulation route to get you as quickly to Dowling as possible, but also a, um, a place where we could accommodate some of the things that people were interested in having the public spaces such as markets, small pop-up concerts, um, food trucks, you know, water play, those kind of water access, those, those sorts of kind of slightly more urban things. And I'll just note too that these parks are in no way designed. What we want to do is kind of show what could fit in these spaces and some of the things that we've heard from the community so far, but we've got a long process to go to actually work out the exact design on this. Um, with the riverfront, that's probably kind of a wraparound where the seawall allows you to get closer to the water on the back side of the CPAC or the Community Performing Arts Venue, as we've been calling it. And again, where you can get a lot of riverfront seating and um, we can do interpretation and education and really take advantage of that linear space as much as possible. And that's just a view of sort of how we might work with that seawall to get people as close to the water as possible, but also try to start restoring the vegetation even in these areas so that we can restore the ecological habitat of the river. With the park space, the 2.3 acre park space here, um, this is kind of our largest space set aside and it could vary quite a bit, but one of the things we do want to keep in mind is that it will be also sort of the neighborhood park for any residences in here as well as a portion of the McKinley neighborhood. So, you know, what form this park takes is much more wide open. Just some of the uses here we wanted to show that it is, for example, large enough to accommodate a multi-purpose green that could have a youth soccer field, you know, some courts or, or something like that, but the details are yet to be figured out. We would have a parkway on here. Um, we're looking at first phase of construction right now. And it's a little bit different in this scenario because the land is so narrow, the piece of land between the railroad tracks and the river, that we are um, proposing that we share this parkway with the city. So it is also their city street, and that's how we can kind of maximize um, getting some of the other things that we've also heard are important, such as the jobs and the housing on this site. But again, this is something that um, is kind of out there for input, and so we're still working through whether how people feel about this parkway. And just an example of how you know we might look at making trying to make this parkway into a space as much as it is a connection for vehicles. We're certainly looking at things like green infrastructure, regional stormwater, um, district stormwater, but that is a layer of design that we haven't really fully gotten into yet. So into the kind of the main topic for tonight has to do with the state bond funding and how the park board um, funding relates to that. So this was a joint city and the park board effort and we've identified kind of the main public improvements that. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Lammers, the time is 7.30 and I think we'll take a break to move into open time. Thank you for the uh, reminders. Um, so hold that thought. Uh, the time being 7.30, I'm going to uh, open up open time. Uh, for those of you uh, watching at home or in the audience, open time is the uh, time of every one of our meetings where we, we receive uh, public comment from members of the community. Um, any individuals wishing to speak can call in, um, can get on our list of speakers by calling in to the park board before 3 p.m. On, uh, on the day that we will be receiving public comment. Uh, open time shall not exceed 15 minutes with uh, time to be allocated by the chair. Um, I have two speakers signed up this evening, so I will allocate three minutes per speaker. Uh, during open time, this is our time to listen to you, so we receive uh, your comment without any public debate. We may ask clarifying questions, but we're not here to debate anything that you're asking, and I may refer you uh, for further information to staff. Um, 
if you have any signs, they are allowed in the chambers, but we ask that people uh, be thoughtful of people who uh, may be having their vision blocked by your signs and ask you to, if you do have a sign you want to display, to uh, display it around the perimeter of the room. Uh, we ask that folks remain seated uh, as long as there are seats available. Uh, there are two types of items that are not, uh, pr that we don't hear at open time, and those are uh, pending litigation and personnel issues. So if you have any feedback on either of those, your best way to get, make sure that commissioners and the superintendent hear that is to uh, reach us, reach out to us directly, and all of our contact information is on the Park Board website. Uh, the Park Board does not tolerate any uh, discriminatory and or harassing words directed at anyone, so we ask that folks uh, keep that in mind while they're making their uh, comments. Uh, that said, I have two speakers signed up for open time. My first speaker is uh, Chris uh, Staley and then Han uh, Zhang. Uh, if, uh, is Chris here this evening? Chris, if you'd like to uh, come forward and state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record and then sure. uh, Secretary Ringgold will put three minutes up on the clock and it's ready to go. Hi, my name is Chris Staley at 1118 Kenwood Parkway. I'm here about resolution 2018286, 2 which I think you're gonna be looking at tonight. Um, one of my questions is to get permission to have a sidewalk from my front door to the walkway. One of the challenges I wanna to bring to this board's attention that was very confusing for us as we applied for a permit the city of Minneapolis, no one told us we also have to go to the park board. There's also rules that say you can have a sidewalk from your front door to the walkway. So again, the confusion here is something I want to call the board's attention more as a homeowner that we got caught in the mix of through this process and almost felt, I think, to the board that we were trying to step around it where it was more confusion on our part. I'd love to see more collaboration with the city to say, hey, how do these two work in the permitting process? Um, secondly, we're asking for use of a retaining wall that was there before, same thing. The third one we're really looking for is to be able to complete a wall on the front sidewalk. Um, I know we've had people talk to us that it's about aesthetics. Um, one of my challenges here is when you walk down to the parks, and I noticed outside, you guys have won awards, for honor awards for concrete design and construction. I'm using Tom Oslin's firm, which has also done a lot of other places. I think it's a great use of land to, to make it more pretty for the homeowners walk by. I'll tell you the people that walk up and down the sidewalk stop and look at the Part of the project that's done, we'd love to complete it the rest of the way, if that's possible. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, my next speaker is Han Zhang. Han, are you here this evening? Um, Han, if you could come forward and state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record. So this is Han Zhang. Um, my name is Han Zhang. I'm um, working with Alden Associates. So I'm the landscape architect to work for Chris Daly on the 1118 Kenwood residence. And we have the permit uh, resolution 2018-286 on um, pending for the planning committee. And we really have, um, one thing we really are trying to do here is trying to create a better environment and better design on the um, inner side of the sidewalk of his property next to his house. And we think, um, and Chris have the full responsibility and he understand if there is any future development for the park board, he will take the responsibility to repair it and maintain it. And it's just like um, literally 10 feet, uh, 8.5 square feet of retaining wall. And we think it will improve the city. So really what we are here is trying to ask the, all the commissioners here and take a look at the application material we have, and it's on the meeting agenda on the website. We have uh, about 20 page application materials with all the supporting graphics and the measurement and the calculations. So hopefully um, the commission can approve our requirement and do a better environment for the city, for the park board and for the homeowner. Thank you. Thank you, Han. That, uh, that is uh, the end of my list of speakers for open time. Uh, I will move back to uh, Ms. Lambert's presentation on the Upper Harbor Terminal. Thank you, President Board. So I just also wanted to note, um, since we're kind of breaking into the more detailed discussion on the funding, that the presentation I just gave you was a very abbreviated presentation of what the community members have gotten and what's online. So you can look online to find it. But again, we can always do um, the more detailed discussion at a different point. 
So with the um, $15 million in state bond funding, basically this joint city and park board effort, this is for public improvements on public lands. So the initial phase of public improvements that will set the stage and allow kind of the rest of the project to develop. So very generally, and some of these are still being determined, but we know that it will likely um, be a lot of work along Dowling to help improve the connection to the project. Um, and then the initial improvements like the parkway, utilities, stormwater system, initial park improvements, and um, possibly improvements over the I-90 bridge since that is a very important connection back to the existing neighborhoods. So the way that the state funding kind of works is that the city and the park board each get a portion and these have been roughly divided um, and then we would need to find a uh, an equal match in local funds um, in order to kind of realize this $15 million in state funds. The state is looking for basically a $30 million state bond project, 15 from the state, 15 from the local funds. And there are some additional funds that like the city, for example, is going to put in, but these are not eligible to be part of the state bond um, project. They are just things that need to be done on the site that would not actually be a portion of this. So when we talk about $30 million of public improvements, it's really going to be 30 plus, um, although we don't know exactly what that number is. So some of the requirements with the state bond, and, and um, different state bonds can be written differently, so this isn't necessarily universal to state bonds, but basically the state will not release any funds until a project is bid, or at least the first portion of a project is bid, and, and the numbers are really quite solid for the rest of the project. Matching funds, any local funds that we provide, need to be used for a state bond eligible project, which very generally is public improvements on public land, um, and that these matching funds need to be secured and essentially in hand at the time that a project is bid so that the state has full confidence that this project is going to happen. So basically, we need to secure $6 million in matching funds um, for this state bond. So for tonight, we're really just looking for a discussion among you. We don't need a decision. We're not necessarily looking for um, consensus and everything. We really want to hear your thoughts. Um, just because you can never look at your entire funding in, with any one project in isolation, it will impact other projects. What we really want to understand is kind of your values, your concerns, your ideas around this funding so that it will help inform how the capital improvement plan comes together. And that is kind of ultimately the vehicle in which you will approve how you know, we meet this. So in, um, there's a lot of information here, but it can kind of be summarized into one sort of key point or question for discussion, which I'll get to right at the end. And Adam is going to correct me if at any point I um, say anything that's wrong. So when we look at potential funding sources, you know, I, the funding sources one and two are basically um, something that we can be reasonably confident in at this point. They are capital improvement um, funds that either are already going towards the Above the Falls Master Plan implementation or um, can be dedicated towards Above the Falls. And um, these would be within the time of we would, when we would be looking at for the improvements, so we know basically that they could be used for this state bond project. I'm skipping funding source three for the moment because that's the one we have a question about. But four, five, and six are all potential places where we see we we think that you know there's the potential to bring these funds in and use them for the state bond match, but we can't be sure of that right now, and we're not sure when we would be sure of these funds. So these are kind of something that we are tracking, but it's not something that we can count on at this point. So funding source number three, and I, I numbered these um, because they were numbered this way in your background packet, is um, basically the one that we really have a question about. So um, as you know, our Bonding package just for Metro Parks in general was reduced this last year, and so that left some of our capital improvement projects underfunded. Um, but then Parks and Trails funding came in slightly higher than anticipated. So with that, um, we could go back and um, make those existing capital improvement projects whole and essentially kind of fulfill what we had originally intended to do on these other projects, um, which are Halls Island, the Gorge, and Waterworks. Um, or we could move this Parks and Trails funding into the Upper Harbor Terminal and use it for the state bond match. So if we look at funding sources one and two, um, which are basically pretty secure, and funding source number three, which I put the star by there, um, we can meet our goal of $6 million match for the state bond funding. If we don't look at, whoops, 
I'm going to go back for just a second because I went through that fast. If we don't look at funding source number three and you know you feel that that might be better dedicated elsewhere and we're at one and two, um, obviously we can look at those other funding sources like four, five, and six and hope that they will come in. But since we can't know that right now, we need to have some sort of a fallback position. And that fallback position is that the city would be willing to loan us the money to meet that $6 million goal. Um, the exact terms could be worked out, but these are kind of some of the key ones for, for you to know, which is basically they would be looking for a regular pay, guaranteed payment, um, a time frame, and you know our interest rate would be equal to their investment rate, and they took a guess at what that would likely be. And we should also note that uh, most of the Park Board capital funding sources cannot be used to pay back a loan, so we would likely need to guarantee this loan with the Park Board general fund. We don't see another way right now to guarantee this loan. So this gets back to really the key question, which is kind of this funding source number three, the additional parks and trails funding. You know, um, How do you feel about dedicating it towards the Upper Harbor Terminal versus kind of going back and um, finishing out the capital improvement commitments that were made on these other projects, knowing that it is possible that we would have to take a loan with this scenario? Thank you, Ms. Lammers. Uh, do commissioners have any uh, comments or uh, questions or would like to provide some <coughs> feedback to staff at this time? I see Commissioner Musich followed by Kogel. Thank you, thank you very much, President Bourne. Uh, so when you were describing the park spaces to us, Kate, you mentioned that there is a 0.8 acre area that may be utilized as a neighborhood park for future residences in this area. Would that <coughs> park space be identified as a neighborhood park within our park category, categorizations or would it be a regional park uh, in, in in its entirety, the entire space. So, Commissioner Musich, the um, possibility of a neighborhood park, sort of within this park boundary, is is definitely a possibility. But it's we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet. So it was um, we were really kind of noting that these meaningful park spaces, in addition to the linear connections and kind of the the linear amenities, would be serving the function as sort of the nearest neighborhood park space for any residences. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they would have the character of a lot of our neighborhood parks. Um, I think if that's part of the engagement process, that's kind of that next layer of detail that we need to get to. And so I think depending on how, you know, what we heard um, were kind of the highest priorities for uses in there, we might determine, you know, the best way to allocate that land. But when I called it a neighborhood park, I didn't mean very specifically that it would be um, legally part of the neighborhood park system. I just meant that it is going to be the nearest meaningful park space for residents, any residences on the Upper Harbor Terminal that are somewhat isolated kind of from the rest of the neighborhood just because of the freeway. Okay. And I guess the reason I asked that is because we have very different funding sources for neighborhood parks than we do for regional parks. And I was wondering if there's a potential for at some point a neighborhood park to be designate, designated in this space that then would be able to um, pull from MPP 20, for instance, or, or that type of funding. Um, President Bourne, uh, Commissioner Musich, I, I would just add that if, um, if any of these park spaces are essentially left out of the regional park boundary and become true neighborhood parks, um, then most of our match funding that we're talking about here would not be allowed to be spent on those parks, and it would probably create a real difficulty um, in the certainly the $6 million match we have to provide, because those sources are going to be state and regional sources, um, and could actually put a monkey wrench into the state bond also. So I think at, at this point, the, the vision for the space has been that it's part of the Above the Falls Regional Park, okay. um, and we probably conceptually want to, want to leave it there for now for funding reasons. Okay. Thank you for the clarification, Adam. Appreciate both of you <coughs> taking the time to answer my question. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. I have uh, Commissioner Kogel, uh, followed by Meyer, followed by Forney. Uh, thank you, President Bourne. I, I initially just have a, a question for uh, Kate or Adam. Um, the Let's say we went with allowing both options one and two and but not option three as a package is it is it possible that there could be a loan that we were taking out of the city that was less than six million dollars and do we know what that number is or is that kind of commissioner kogel definitely we would 
we would take out the minimum loan um, okay. that we could. And so. so that number is in flux. It could be anywhere within from zero to six million. So if we were to take, um, so if we were to use sources, funding sources one and two uh, for the Upper Harbor Terminal, but take it alone to kind of fill the gap left by funding uh -huh. source number three, we're probably looking at a two to two and a half million dollar loan right now. And that, that does not necessarily take into account that some of the other funding sources that we talked about could potentially reduce the loan if not eliminated too. So, but with funding sources right. one and two, we get to... Um, having about a two to two and a half million dollar gap left. Okay, and and if we take funding sources one and two, what, um, maybe I, I just missed this, but are, are we essentially just pushing down the, pushing away the, the money, or pushing away the work that the, it, the that funding is currently being allocated for? I mean, is, we, we have to find essentially new dollars for that at a later date? Uh, President Bourne, Commissioner Cogill, um, uh, not not exactly. So okay. the, the funding source three would definitely push, or it would leave projects incomplete that were under bonded. Um, funding source one is money that the CIP has already dedicated to above the falls implementation. So it's already set for projects like this, mm -hmm. um, and would go toward a project like this. The funding number two is in a further out year where under the uh, regional equity metrics. Um, we dedicate 25% of the total regional funding to some combination of our two basically unbuilt regional parks, of which Above the Falls is one. In last year's CIP, I put that entire 25%, and the board approved the entire 25% to go toward the missing link, because it has not had funding significantly over, uh, uh, over time. Um, what option two would do is it would instead as you approve the next CIP, it would allocate that funding instead to Above the Falls. And then in the very following year, we would then go to Missing Link. So there's no project at Missing Link right now. Um, there's a lot of land acquisition, presumably, that needs to happen there first. So I think that having that funding come in 2024 instead of 2023 is probably not a realistic project delay. It's probably just um, kind of a funding mechanism. So I don't think that there's real projects that get put off under options one and two. In options three, there are real projects that get put off. Thank you. Um, okay. I mean, I suppose the cliche that robbing Peter to pay Paul is maybe uh, due for funding source number three. I certainly wouldn't want to undercut um, what would make those projects in, in that funding source whole, um, but that, that's my thought right now. I'm curious to hear what other commissioners think. Thank you, Commissioner Colgill, Commissioner Meyer. Um, when do you expect that we would need to make a decision on where these, um, where the funding would need to come from? Um, President Bourne, uh, Commissioner Meyer, I think our intent is to have a mechanism within the next adopted CIP that shows how we're going to achieve our $6 million match. So during the budgeting process, um, of, of which the CIP is a part, um, that that would be the mechanism. So essentially what we're looking for right now is kind of some impression and guidance and then I'll be working on the CIP with staff and with the superintendent uh, and we'll be presenting a draft CIP to you on October 17th along with the budget and there's an opportunity for additional discussion at that time which is why tonight we're really we're really just trying to get an impression about where the board feels like it wants to go. But, but you would make that final decision in your in your budgeting adoption basically. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to have to take a closer look at the trade-offs with each different option. I don't, you know, have uh, any comment on that right now. But when I was advocating for the bonding funds uh, at the legislature, you know, I was under, under the assumption that we were going to take out a loan for it. So that's that's my default assumption, and I, I hope that we don't end up taking you know money away from other areas that have been neglected, including you know the missing link, at least in you know. Um, if it's just a temporary delay until we have a, a project ready there, then that would be fine. But um, you know, that's an area that d doesn't have any parks for, for part of it. Uh, so I hope we can, you know, keep the money there as well and, and not, um, you know, invest in one neglected area at the expense of others. 
Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer, Commissioner Forney. Thank you. Um, Mississippi Gorge, what obligations do we have there presently? Uh, President Gordon, Commissioner Forney, what do you, um, can well, you expand you indicate, on obligations? When you indicate that um, some of the, reduce some of the bonding funds for Mississippi Gorge. Um, so, <coughs> President Born, Commissioner Forney, um, we constructed our CIP uh, last year and adopted it as such with the assumption of a $15 million state bond that would be matched by Met Council. Uh, what ultimately came in is a $10 million state bond that was matched, that will be matched by Met Council. And so in order to um, address that $10 million, we've made some preliminary staff decisions to retain funding in Waterworks and, uh, and Halls Island um, and to uh, actually zero out the planned allocation to the gorge. Um, that number previously was uh, $1.1 million. Okay. Um, which, again, I'll state that through the additional parks and trails money um, uh, that, that has now come our way, essentially there was a bond reduction for us under that 15 to $10 million change of about $1.7 million. And there's an additional $2 million in parks and trails money over two years um, beyond what our CIP is built on. Um, and that's just sort of better tax receipts is where that comes from. So under uh, one scenario, obviously that $1.1 million in the gorge and also smaller reductions at uh, uh, Waterworks and at uh, Halls Island could be restored through parks and trails money into the CIP. Um, or that money could be directed to the Upper Harbor Terminal. So for the gorge, it's basically $1.1 million that, okay. is, um, uh, that is unaccounted for. Thank you for the clarity. Um, so just a blanket statement I don't think I could, could give, but um, as far as waterworks and halls, well, first of all, waterworks, being that we're partnering, I feel an obligation to fulfill that um, and not draw from that, I guess is the best way to say it. As far as halls, I'm not sure that we have really, quote, unquote, obligations but we have expectations from ex particularly you know community we might have obligations but anyway so as far as prioritizing I would say that you know first you know to whatever um, access the Mississippi Gorge move then to halls and then to waterworks I would prefer none of it happening but that would be at least my initial you know prioritizing so I guess I have a couple of other questions. Um, so um, in the packet, it talks something about the fact that future, there might be at, at this point in time, or however it was phrased, about the park dedication uh, fee. Did you, is there some aspect or some time that we might be generating some park dedication fees there? Commissioner Forney, um, not on the Upper Harbor Terminal site. So basically, um, it's kind of a, a three-way deal where the city would give us the 15 and a half or however much right. we end up with for parkland, land um, for free to fulfill that park dedication obligation that is more than we would get off of kind of the 10% the that you um, can sometimes take with park dedication. And so in doing so, then we would waive park dedication on this entire site, having sort of that obligation has already been fulfilled. So that's why we don't see it as a source of revenue for this project. Okay, and I guess I just, you know, wondering how it was phrased was number one, but um, number two, the adjacent properties to the Upper Harbor, those will be assessed um, a park dedication fee? Commissioner Forney, yes, that is correct. Okay. So those would not be included in any, any land transactions. So there is the possibility of future park dedication coming to the site, just Being not generated. specifically from the upper. Okay, I right, just wanted that clarity. Um, and then <laughs> if the blue line does go through, how much was that amount? <laughs> 
the land acquisition amount? Uh, President uh, Born, Commissioner Forney, the total uh, land transaction amount um, uh, negotiated with Blue Line and approved by the board is about six hundred and ninety thousand dollars for temporary and permanent easements. Okay. I mean, it's a lot of money, but in the scope of six million, it's yeah, okay. Um, good. Well, that's helpful for me. Um, I could say you know, to me, um, I, I feel we have an obligation to fulfill some pro um, promises. So th I would hesitate, but like I say, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, that would be my prioritizing if we were to um, go with number three, <laughs> as you call it. Um, Just looking at all my notes to see if there was any other question I had. Okay. Um, oh, MWMO. Have we been speaking at all with MWMO as far as funding some of the, you know, um, project? Um, and, I mean, you know, they were so helpful at the sculpture garden, things like that. And I didn't know if that's one aspect of um, the six million that possibly we could be utilizing some of those sources. Commissioner Forney, um, we have definitely been talking to MWMO all along through this project. And, um, you know, they've often come in in the past and helped with shoreline restoration, for example, um, or, you know, stormwater, kind of water related improvements. At this point, especially without any kind of an approved concept and everything, you know, they're, they're still very interested in the process, but um, certainly not ready to make any kind of commitments yet. But our understanding is a lot of the things that they might fund, they would certainly be a potential third party funder. A lot of the things that they might fund okay. should be eligible for the state grants. So if that were to work out, then, you know, they, they could certainly possibly be one of the third party funders that helps. Super. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Forney, I have a couple of questions. Um, Commissioner Forney asked my question about park dedication funds. Um, the, the project is built out into phases, and, and as I understand it, the, well, how much, uh, approximately how much of the totality that we're bringing to, to the table is, is phase one of the build out? Um, Commissioner Bourne, are you asking like um, how much of the state bond and our local match would be phase one versus I, phase two? I, I think what I'm asking is, is my understanding is that the over the life of the project from from start to finish, we have to develop, we have to contribute a six million dollar match. Am I understanding? Am I understanding that correctly? So how, how long do we have? How long do we have to deliver our six million dollar match? Can that all be on the back end of the? Can our? Can that all be on the back end of the build out? Uh, so maybe. Um, okay. So basically, my understanding of the state bond is that here um, at some point fairly soon, and we are looking at probably around the end of the year when we had the concept a, a little bit more figured out, we would need to submit an application for the state bond that kind of outlines approximately what our projects are gonna be and what the funding sources are going to be. And this is not anything that cannot change, um, but you know we would wanna have it pretty well identified by that point. Um, I think my understanding is that once we are looking at actually trying to get the project started, um, there is about a five year timeline where you're expected to have it completed and so there isn't an exact start date, so we can't say an exact end date. Um, so in that way, you know, we would probably put it at around five, five plus a little bit years to um, spend this money. Then there's also the question of needing to have the money in hand at the time that you go out to bid. Um, so there may be a certain amount of um, gymnastics that we would have to do in order to have a secured funding source, um, but some of, guaranteed at the beginning of the project, but some of the funds, like for example, the 2023 funds that we talked about would likely come <coughs> in after we are thinking about bidding, but construction is going to take a fair amount of time for you know 30 plus million dollars of public improvements. And so those funds could be spent directly as they come in. We would just have to kind of watch our funding sources and, and spend um, plan for how they got spent. 
If, that answers my question. Yeah. Um, if um, if we were to look at the scenario where we um, leverage debt either from the city or from a different source, um, what would a repayment schedule like that look like that we would have to address every year for ten years? What would we? What would a annual payment on a debt service of six million dollars look like? So I, I don't think that we have that detailed of information. Basically, the city has said that they would want a loan repaid back in less than 10 years. Okay. Um, so since we are likely not looking at a $6 million loan, but you know, say more like a two or two and a half million dollar loan, um, potentially, I think we could have quite a few years to pay that off. They are looking to set up a regular payment schedule, schedule um, but they haven't been that specific about it. And basically, um, I think it would partly be up to us too, because we would be incurring interest on you know how rapidly we felt like we wanted to, to spend that down. But basically, within 10 years was kind of um, where the preliminary discussions have gone. Okay. I think Jennifer Phillips. Oh, I'm sorry, Secretary, uh, Deputy Superintendent Rangel. President Bourne, uh, commissioners, uh, thank you for that question. One thing to note, and as Kate has said, I don't think we know what it would look like exactly. Um, but recognize in the first year of paying that back, say we're going to make the same increment amounts over several years, you would see a levy increase. And you'd have to decide, are you going to cut to pay for that out of the levy, or are you going to add to the levy? And you know, just the kind of metrics that we work with is a 1% levy increase would equate to about $615,000. So just knowing that you'd want to think about when that happened, because it would be part of current service level after that, but initially you'd have a bump. Okay. Thank you, um, Deputy Super uh, Deputy Superintendent. Um, I that that is kind of uh, you may have anticipated my next question that I was asking at, after that, but I, I do. I, I just my comment would be, you know, Commissioner Meyer has made comments about this in in other conversations that we have, and I do. Um, cautiously agree with that approach. I, I think the Minneapolis Park Board under leverages are uh, under leverages debt. And uh, I think the um, I think that this would be something that we would uh, that I would like to see some scenarios to at least have those options on, on, on the table. So um, so we know if it's if it's a minimal debt service that the organization can handle as opposed to not delivering on the promises that uh, Commissioner Forney referenced, um, I think that that would be something that this board would want to consider. Um, I have Commissioner Forney for a second time. Thank you. Uh, just clarity. Um, the amphitheater and any other um, private development, those will all be on city property? Commissioner Forney, so um, any private development is likely to be sold through a redevelopment agreement to you know the developers. So yes, on, on private property, um, the the amphitheater or the CPAC as we've been calling it, it it's a little bit more complicated. It's kind of um, would likely be a joint venture um, and with the city and with the developer, um, but the park board would not be involved. So as it is shown right now, the CPAC is not on park board land. So is the conversation with the city that the, it would be um, a, a, a taxable property? Commissioner Forney, I believe so, but I cannot remember the specifics of the conversation. So that's something I would have to check in and make sure I'm getting you the right information. But definitely it's not going to be on park board property. Uh, okay. not, not in the concept right now. It is okay. not on park board property. Thank you for the clarification. Um, and as far as leveraging, you know, debt, um, I'm not sure what the scenario would be as far as we have debt, we, we have taken out loans, what that looks like in comparison to with the city. Um, and just curious, I mean, we do have a bit of debt service, so I just, you know, um, if we have any comparisons of all that. 
Uh, President Board and Commissioner Forney, um, related to both of your questions, I think what, what we'll need to do, Kate and I, is, is really have our finance team take a look at, um, in a way, sort of a theoretical scenario uh, around loan repayment, and then also ask them to look at where we may have done this before. Um, and I think that's something, that's information that we can uh, bring to you um, as we continue through the budgeting process, but it's it's a, an extra level exploration that we need to do that we've not, okay. not done to this point. So we'll take that on. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Um, I think Council Race wants to add in something, but I, uh, Commissioner Forney's question made me remember the last question that I had. Uh, you had mentioned the uh, the co-developers are looking at uh, approach uh, going into a bonding request in 2020 uh, that would be sponsored by the city. I'm just wondering if we have had a thought about strategy around that. So, th so this year um, we had kind of an all hands on deck shared. Um, shared legislative agenda to make the Upper Harbor Terminal our top priority. And so I just want to, um, if we're going back to the well on that same request, and if that will be a similar strategy in the 2020 session, then this board probably needs to start thinking about, um, is that the same strategy we want to use? And will we have a concert of interest with the city um, in the 2020 ses session or it, will we have some of our own priorities that year? So um, I don't expect us to have an answer for a couple legislative sessions out today, but that's something I think we'd want to think about. But I, I think Council Ray said something that uh, he wanted to make us aware of. Um, it, uh, and I'll be real brief. First, I'd like to compliment Adam and uh, Ms. Uh, Lamers for a really great overview of this project. Uh, it's very intricate. The staff's been working on it for a long time. I think it really is important the board spend it's not been quite an hour on it, and I'll try to make sure I don't extend it to an hour by my comments. But the board should know this is a major initiative on the river. The, the city owns approximately 50 acres of the Upper Harbor. It's been repurposed. It's a pretty unique opportunity in the sense that the city hasn't they bought this land years ago. It's been used for different purposes. It's a great opportunity. This is something that actually the board initiated about three years ago when uh, then Superintendent Miller worked with Council President uh, Barb Johnson who wanted to do something, couldn't get it through the city. The park board brought it forward. It didn't happen the first year, but the next couple years, a really robust partnership with the city developed, and it was the number one priority for the city in the last session. Um, getting through a Republican legislature, uh, $15 million was a big number uh, relative to it. Uh, the park board, I think, uh, said it would partner with the city, which meant that we were basically saying, um, Formally and informally that we would come up with six million was kind of the number kicked around to help make a start of this um, As you saw from the plans the community engagement this has quite the potential to transform the riverfront we've done a lot on the, around this area on the southern end putting a flag in the ground that far up on Dowling Avenue on the other side of the river um, could really be quite transformative. And I think uh, the staff coming forward tonight will also tell you it's a great project, but it's also going to take some work by the board to figure out your priorities and can you fit it in, how can you fit it in. Um, the, um, there's a number of strategies they've brought forward. Um, I don't think you're ultimately going to be able to do this on the cheap. It's going to take some money and you're going to have to carve it out in this for this board, um, if it moves ahead on the schedule they're talking about and the uh, First Avenue people, Thor Construction, United Properties can really get something going, this could well be a big signature part of what this uh, board does. And um, you probably haven't heard the last of it. And uh, trying to find $6 million is, um, we, that's why we have a, a robust strategy with the legislature. We've worked on park dedication fee a lot. You asked a lot of good questions about exhausting that, the watershed district. Um, I think that the staff has done a real good job in looking at it. I mean, the, the watershed district will probably pay a part in this, but you're probably going to have to start looking at your own sources to get it done. Um, park dedication fee, since the city owns the land, and I think Kate said as much as 14, 15 acres out of 50 acres. I mean, the park board's looking at getting 30% of the land on the thing. That's a pretty big number, and then you have to maintain it in other strategies. But again, this was part of being successful at the legislature and getting what you wanted. No, Thank you. Got it. Uh, Find the money. And I, my last point would be that uh, I know President Bourne would agree. Um, 
to describe the park board's borrowing practices, I'd say we were hard money Democrats in the Jacksonian tradition, <laughs> which uh, Jackson didn't want to. I'm sure Commissioner Myers, a history fan, didn't believe the Jackson didn't believe in internal improvements and borrowing money. Um, but um, the park board doesn't have a Julie Wiseman's here. She's probably better explaining what your debt situation is, but. Generally, the park board hasn't gone too deeply in debt on on projects. Um, She's got something to looks like she has something to say. With that, in fact, <laughs> <laughs> Ms. So if, Weisman, I go over, if you go over the hour, you started this debate at uh, seven fifteen. Don't blame your council. Miss Wiseman, would you like to uh, address this board of uh, FDR New Dealers? <laughs> and... President Born and Commissioners, um, thanks for having me tonight. <laughs> I'm glad I came. For this conversation. Um, I just would like to cautiously remind everyone that when you take out a loan, you have to pay back that loan. Plus you are creating a brand new park that you now have to operate and maintain. Plus you have recreation youth programming that you all have said that you want to focus on. And I don't know what kind of appetite you have for property tax levy increases, but I would just caution you in saying that you think that there's, um, what was the term? I, did, I can't remember the term. That there's room for debt service. Leverage debt. Levering, levering, thank you. And to give you examples of different things that we have done, um, in the enterprise fund, we financed the um, acquisition, or not acquisition, but we financed the, the construction of the Neiman Sports Complex, $14.2 <laughs> million that we uh, financed over a 20 year period. Uh, we have financed the parade park, or parade ice improvements by $9.8 million that are financed over a 13 year period. We purchased the Northeast Ice Arena, took on the debt for the Northeast Ice Arena, uh, $710,000 over a 15 year period. When we purchased the headquarters building, uh, I don't have that on here because that one's actually paid off, but we took out a mortgage for this building. Uh, and 3 .3. we have just done 40, 22 and a half, or excuse me, the Michael P. Schmidt <laughs> Operations <laughs> Center uh, with a mortgage. So we have used mortgage and debt um, quite a bit, and it does impact your ability to do day-to-day -day operations. Thank you, Ms. Wiseman. I see Commissioner Musich, I think, followed by Commissioner Kogel. Ms. Wiseman, if you could stay, I have a question for you. Perhaps it would be helpful for my colleagues if you put in context what the debt service annually would be on a $2.2 .2 million loan over a 10-year period. Um, I President Boren and Commissioner Musich, I'm not that good. I can't calculate <laughs> 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 yeah. No, I think staff has direction to bring back some scenario to bring back some scenarios for us. Commissioner Musich, you have an additional question or comment? Okay, uh, Commissioner uh, Kogel. Um, okay, uh, I guess I wanted to uh, first have a, a question if. Uh, we went with options one, two, four, and five, right? Would that, is it, is it your estimation that that would cover the entire amount or would a loan still need to be taken out? We took everything but number three, or is that an unknown at this time? Commissioner Kogel, I'm just going to go back to what options four <laughs> and five were. So Those are the speculative ones, I suppose. Yep, or four, five, four, five, and six, and six. Yes, are yes, all yes, speculative. Yeah. Well, I am not actually sure if we can speculate on the land acquisition funds. I mean, third party funding could be all over the place. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know how we could put a number okay. to that. I don't, know. Okay. I don't know if we can give any detail on option four. Right, okay. Uh, uh, over the course of the discussion, I just wanted to say that uh, thinking through this, uh, you know, to, to Secretary Ring Ringgold's point that we take out a loan with the city and then we have to go back and ask the city for a higher levy amount to pay for the loan that we took out with the city seems somewhat 
problematic and something that we should maybe consider um, as we're thinking about. You know, it, it would be difficult and really frustrating to have to choose option three as well and, and underfund some of our projects. But I mean, if this is a commitment that we want to make and we kind of led the way in making it, then I think it it might behoove us to consider that as as a, a difficult choice that that needs to needs to to happen. Thank you, Commissioner Cogill. Are there any further? Uh, questions of staff or comments. Um, uh, Ms. Lammers, uh, Mr. Arvidsson, thank you for your presentation and for the incredible amount of work that you've done this far. Um, do you have the direction that you need for this evening? Okay, thank you. Then we will, uh, we will move on to uh, petitions and communications. Uh, this week I will start with uh, Commissioner Meyer. Pass. Uh, Commissioner Cogill. Uh, well, I'll first say that I went to my first BET meeting this evening uh, uh, to see Commissioner Bourne uh, in the spotlight there. It was great. We, uh, both Commissioner French and I spoke in support of uh, the 5.7% levy request. I want to thank uh, Superintendent Merrill, um, Director Julie Wiseman for their presentation. It, I think it went very well and uh, very hopeful for, for the levy, levy request. Um, so that was a lot of fun, and I look forward to the bike tour on Sunday. Thank you, Commissioner Cogill, Vice President Hassan. Yes. Uh, uh, Commissioner French. <coughs> yes. Uh, first of all, I went to my first Monarch Festival. Uh, it was awesome. It was tons of folks out there. I had some good food and talked to a bunch of folks from uh, from the neighborhood and people who are really concerned about the plight of butterflies. And now I'm concerned about the plight of butterflies. So. Uh, <clears throat> also want to thank uh, Mayor Jacob Fry, who uh, is becoming a partner in our full service community school efforts and our initiative to create uh, spaces for folks to go no matter what time of day it is and what they need to do. Our schools and our parks could work in so many different diverse ways. So uh, thanks, thank you, Jacob Fry, and thank you, uh, the rest of the BET that went with uh, John, John O'Donnell, and it was watching our government work in different ways and sometimes obscure ways that people don't really always know about. So thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be a park commissioner. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner French, Commissioner Forney. Thank you, um, uh, Commissioner Vitale, who is in Atlanta right now, and we all hope that she's not going to get swept away in the hurricane. Uh, and I were able to attend the Upper Harbor Terminal. We got to listen to Kate in more detail um, about that and just express that the community is so excited about this. Um, I mean, it is something we've been talking about. I mean, I was on the original um, Above the Falls uh, Citizen Advisory Committee, and it's been something that's been talked about for a couple decades now. So um, I'm very happy to see that we're at the point of dollars and cents. Um, the Monarch Festival, yes, is just magical. It really is. Um, but an absolutely gorgeous day that Mother Nature um, gave us as well. So um, kudos to um, our district commissioner for continuing to advocate for that. Um, uh, I went to the ECHO board meeting with Commissioner Cogill, um, and um, and then I also went to the West Calhoun Neighborhood Council meeting, and um, both, I think, really wanted to hear our input as far as uh, the 2040 plan, and particularly our um, approach to the shoreland overlay. I think that both of those communities are uh, very concerned uh, about the erosion, literally, figuratively, and of um, our shoreline. So um, uh, I was trying to give them assurances that we will be advocating on behalf of that. I also want to indicate that um, the Linden Hills Bocce Ball League had their final um, tournament, whatever, last night, and they told me that they have found another $10,000 worth of money to put in ADA accessibility pads, concrete pads, and some... Um, benches thanks to Bremer uh, Bank Foundation so very happy that was a, a lovely just win-win uh, delightful group of people to work with I went to the sunshine sunrise breakfast with the um, Minneapolis Foundation and what was very it, it was a very inspiring um, speaker who talked about building trust in our community so um, I hope that I can 
spread the word on those things. I went to the MWMNO, had a stormwater management watershed workshop for elected officials. And what was really fun is that we then took a walk around uh, this tower side area and um, to see the memorandum that we passed uh, today and what that is really going to look like. They've done some marvelous work, the development that's going on there, and um, I'm excited to see a bridal veil um, trail going through that. And lastly, I just wanted to mention that um, this Saturday, there's, no, it's the following Saturday, um, there's going to be a violence-free event down at um, Thomas Beach from 9 to 10, um, and so I encourage people to, to go to that. And lastly, yes, go to the bike. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to show off the T-shirt. I think it's one of the best graphics that we've had for the, um, the bike tour, so um, you can still register for it. Please, please come. It's always a fabulous event. Thank you, Commissioner Forney, Commissioner Severson. Passed. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, thank you, President Bourne. I, too, attended the Monarch Festival uh, this past weekend with my husband, my son, for the first year since we've lived on the south side. Uh, wasn't able to go with us because he was working, but it was beautiful to see so many families and uh, neighborhood residents and just people from all over the city. Uh, celebrating this beautiful migration of butterflies from Mexico to Canada, passing through Minneapolis. It's a pretty awesome thing to get to witness. Uh, I also just wanted to take a moment to thank all the staff and volunteers uh, that took time out of their lives to make sure that this was as awesome as it always is <laughs> and, and made sure that even though it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, you still got that uh, small town feel of getting a chance to run into people you don't get to see uh, at, at other times of the year. So it was, it was a beautiful event, very excited uh, at how well it went. And I'm looking forward to seeing the bike tour be just as successful this weekend. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Musich. Uh, I will uh, be brief. Um, Moments ago, um, I signed the, uh, executed the donation agreement with the uh, LOPET for the trailhead building. Um, the, um, I want to thank Mr. Munger for how quickly and diligently he cleaned up the uh, lien issues with the building once the park board um, expressed its concern. I think that was done by Monday in the AM, so uh, we're glad that the um, the agreement can get back on track. Um, there was a uh, over. Uh, there was an oversight. One more oversight with uh, construction around uh, the use of labor with the agreement and um, use of use of organized labor with the the agreement. Uh, Mr. Munger very proactively reached out to the Building Trades uh, Building Trades Council to see how that could be reconciled, and uh, the Building Trades Council had reported back that they had come to an agreement with uh, Mr. Munger on some future work. Um, so uh, we're very glad to have our partners ready to go. Um, and. Um, Moving on, I want to thank, I uh, give a special uh, thanks to, oh, yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a long time coming. Um, I want to give a real special thanks to our finance, uh, our finance staff, especially Director Wiseman, uh, Superintendent Merrill for uh, just really uh, knocking their presentation at the BET out of the park. Um, it, it was, um, uh, we had, uh, uh, probably about a dozen community members show up in support uh, for a BET levy pub public hearing. Uh, every single person, there was not a single person that commented on anything other than the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board levy, and 100% of the commenters were in support of the Minneapolis Park Board levy. Uh, that really reflects the fact that 100% of the Minneapolis Board Park Board of Commissioners are in support of this levy. So um, I'm really, uh, really proud and encouraged that the mayor uh, signaled in his budget address his down payment for uh, investment in youth in the city of Minneapolis, and we're looking forward to uh, working with uh, working with his staff and really just kind of highlighting the fact. Uh, you know, I've been on this, I've gone through this budget cycle. Uh, this will be my ninth budget cycle that I've gone through. Um, virtually. I, I struggle to remember a budget cycle that I've went through during the, my time on the board where we haven't started with what do we have to give up this year 
And uh, so I really want to thank uh, the mayor. Uh, the, one of the very first conversations that Superintendent Merrill and I had with the mayor, he said, what do you, what do you need for current service level? We set a number. And he said, without question, I will support that. And so um, this board has really demonstrated um, a really great victory moving in and sig signaling some continued cooperation with the city of Minneapolis. So uh, thank you to my colleagues there. Um, and again, thank you to commissioners uh, Kogel and French for also coming to the BET and testifying in, in favor of the levy. Um, seeing uh, no other business, I would entertain a motion to adjourn the regular meeting. It's been moved. Is there a second? Uh, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? We are adjourned. And moving to Chair Colgill. The time being 826. Uh, I'd like to call the Administration and Finance Committee to order. Uh, Secretary Ringgold, please call the roll. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Commissioner French. Here. Vice Chair Musich. Present. Chair Colgill. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, I'd entertain an approve, a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Uh, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, September the 5th, 2018. So moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Uh, we have a single study report item on dockless bike share. Um, Assistant Superintendent Ringgold. A little bit more neon than it was. <laughs> <laughs> My apology. Uh, thank you, Chair Cogill, Commissioners. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share with you some information tonight on dockless bike share. You've started to see on certain line bikes in and around the city, and you likely know that some of um, our neighboring cities have introduced Lime, and Minneapolis will soon introduce a dockless bike share program as well. We are very fortunate in Minneapolis to have some really great thinkers on this topic. Um, Robin Hutchinson, or Hutchinson from uh, Public Works at the city of Minneapolis has been fantastic. Um, Bill Dossett with Nice Ride has been a really phenomenal thinker on this topic. My understanding is that people across the country who are part of Bike Share are watching uh, curiously to see how things will go in Minneapolis and, and kind of the programs that are being rolled out. But I want to make sure everyone is uh, up to speed and has a sense of where I think, uh, I think we're going and has an opportunity to weigh in if, uh, if you feel like we should go a different way. I anticipate shortly that uh, you will be asked to approve um, a permit or a lease agreement, so I, I want to get you prepped for that. So uh, shared active transportation is kind of the big name that a lot of these shared transportation modes are, are recognized under. We have had the nice ride system, which is a docked bike system for quite a while. We've started to see scooters pop up into our right-of-ways as well. And initially, a lot of this work was very structured around a nonprofit and public entities working together to make this, this happen. That's what happened here locally. We actually had a federal grant and a nonprofit in the city as the conduit that helped bring us our Nice Ride program. More recently, uh, as of kind of the beginning of last year, you started to see that model change a little bit, and you started to see the ability for bikes to be in the public right away without a dock with a simple, as you can see in the corner here, lock on the back wheel that could be unlocked using an app function. This uh, was primarily started to be driven by for-profit organizations who were able to dump significant levels of bikes within to a community in a short time period. And commonly, the local agencies were uh, short-circuited or not engaged in the actual process of how those things would roll out. And that has been com become kind of the dockless technology that we are seeing. There's been mixed success with the approaches that people have taken. Sometimes it ends up pretty orderly, and sometimes it, it doesn't. In, in 
Minneapolis, like I said, I feel like some of the leaders of this type of work have really tried to get out ahead of it to try to help make sure that in Minneapolis it's more orderly and provides a better, a better product. So as I have indicated, Minneapolis took an approach where they established an ordinance where you have to be a licensed provider within the city of Minneapolis to have dockless bike share within their right of way. Uh, they have provided a license to nice ride slash motivate, so there's a, a combination there. Motivate is a for-profit company who provides the dockless option. This was a, uh, an RFP that actually nice ride issued to be able to secure who they would uh, move forward with. And we're anticipating a rollout starting next week. Um, this will be a short time period. They'll roll out starting next week. They might get up to 1,500 bikes total, and by early November, they will be closing down the system for the year. St. Paul conducted their own RFP, and they selected Lime Bike, um, and they started rolling out in August. And we know our neighboring uh, cities to the other side, both Edina and Golden Valley, they are in a situation where they have an MOU. They're doing a pilot project. They haven't formed at this point a long-term relationship that I know of. When it comes to thinking about this program, there's uh, many aspects to think about it, but part of it is what might be the fees or pricing that you would associate with these bikes being in either public spaces or public right away. As a park system, we don't actually, as the Minneapolis park system, we don't actually have right away. So our parkways are not right away, they're actually assets within parks. So we don't fit under some of the right away conversations. We are specifically Parkland, and so we don't we don't get covered per se in the city's ordinance on that. But in that context, we will have some things to think about in terms of the types of fees that we would we charge. In terms of uh, is there a transaction fee? Is there a, uh, a fee that would be more along the lines of a ground lease for where the sites are where you can park the bikes? Is there an overall license fee? And some of the guidance that we find um, really lays out. The, uh, the metrics that you should think about as you establish those fees from administration and oversight costs, direct costs, to the planning and engagement that's involved to think about this work. The direction we are recommending at this point or that we would uh, recommend moving forward from, at least from a staff point, is that we would, uh, in the near term, establish a permit system to allow uh, bikes to be within the Minneapolis park system that we would be part of the dockless piece or the dockless bike uh, movement. What we would uh, articulate is that there would be a requirement in that, that permit that you would be licensed within the city of Minneapolis that builds on the benefits that we're seeing that nice ride slash motivate are able to provide to the city as a whole. And some of those things are that based on the agreement that nice ride and motivate have with the city, they have to do equitable distribution of the bikes. They can't just do a market you know, share movement of the bikes. The other big thing that's happened in this agreement is that there is still a significant amount of docked infrastructure that has not reached the end of its useful life that was paid for through federal grants. And in this work with the, with the city of Minneapolis and, and um, the Nice Ride Motivate combination, they are taking on that infrastructure and continuing to run it to the end of its useful life. So we were able to get the benefit of that, that, full, um, that infrastructure for its full life. We uh, are working on, in this permit, establishing some categories for fees, as well as what would be a penalty um, if bikes were left in undesignated locations. Uh, what we would, um, what we're working toward is something that would be an annual license fee. This would cover the administrative costs associated with uh, reviewing the sites where the bikes are able to be parked, with reviewing the um, uh, materials associated with the actual permit process. And what I should say before I, before I go a little bit further on, on this, because it'll make more sense when I get to the last one, is we also suggest in the same way that the city is, is moving forward is that you actually have virtual stations, that you don't have the ability for the bikes to be parked just anywhere, that they actually are parked in a location that is delineated with a line and a set of 
of indicators that show you how to, to park that bike within that location that you would be able to locate on an app. This is uh, maybe not something that would be forever. Maybe that would be a short time, time period to get a sense of how this works, but in the near term that there would actually be designated parking areas. So that'll make a little bit more sense when we get to the, to the last one there. Uh, we also, uh, in addition to that license fee, uh, are considering a transaction fee percentage. So in our park system, if you are making money in the park si system, we are usually, as an organization, securing 10 to 12 percent of that transaction based on the type of organization that you are. And this is, so this would be, if you think of Wheel Fun or some of the other concessionaires that we have in the system. And finally, there's uh, that area where the bikes would actually be parked, and there would be the possibility to look at a, a ground lease fee for that space for uh, within this permit piece. So those are the, the three types of fees. The, the one penalty that we'd be looking at is if the bike was not parked within a designated area or if your bike was not from a company who we had permitted, we would charge that company $100 per bike that wasn't removed promptly from the system or uh, was, a, was you know, essentially abandoned within the, the Minneapolis park system. And then we would take it to the impound lot. So. Next step, we anticipate that Nice Ride um, slash Motivate will come to us yet this year, might be on your October 3rd agenda, uh, to ask for virtual stations that would add on to some of the existing stations that we have within the system. So they would be right adjacent to the docked stations. We anticipate for 2019, so this would be kind of over the winter that this work would, would happen, that they would be asking for docked stations throughout, the, or dockless stations, excuse me, throughout the whole system, with potentially being at least one per park throughout the, throughout the whole system. With our regional parks, certainly they'd be requesting more than one. And that would be another request that we'd bring back to you probably early in the, late in the winter, or early in the spring of next year. So with that, I would love to get your thoughts and would love to answer any questions you might have. In particular, if you don't think this is the right direction, this would be a really good time to, to share that. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold. Uh, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, Chair Cowgill. Uh, I'm very glad that we are being so thoughtful here in Minneapolis about the way that these uh, dockless bike stations are getting rolled out. Uh, I've been in other cities that that didn't happen, and it's quite clear. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm pleased to see that we are being thoughtful about it and putting a plan in place and talking about um, talking about it to a level that we're getting to even into the fees and. Uh, I appreciate the direction we're going. I, I don't have any suggestions at this time for changes, but I, I would ask that we start talking about the scooters that are all over town. Um, I work downtown. It's a hot mess. People are leaving them blocking entrances, blocking sidewalks. Yes, there's a downtown improvement district that can deal with that, but uh, it, it's going to be a problem in parks as well, particularly around ADA issues. Um, I, I have the ability to move things when they're blocking my way. Not everyone has that. And uh, these companies clearly don't really care that that's what's happening. So if we could start a proactive conversation with them about how, that, how their property is being utilized in our public system um, and, and the potential to create spaces where they can be dropped off instead of just willy-nilly like in the midst of a lawn where we now have a lawnmower that can't do their job, <laughs> or in the midst of a trail where someone needs to be able to move through that space in a safe manner. Um, that would be great. So I, I'm sorry, I know I'm a bit off topic, and I, I appreciate you not calling me out of order, <laughs> uh, but it'd be great if we could have this conversation about those as well. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Chair Cogill, Commissioner Musich, we are already starting to have that discussion, but we wanted to bring them through one at a time, so that will be one of the next ones we bring forward. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe Commissioner French is next. I guess uh, Commissioner Musich kind of said a lot that I wanted to say in, in conversation about uh, some of the other transportation devices that we are using in our city uh, that are not necessarily 
traditional. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I do want to have a conversation, maybe not now, but about not just the scooters, but any other type of transportation uh, devices that may come up in the future and, and how we can be, uh, as a park board, more accommodating, right? Because if, if these technologies are going to keep keep coming and keep existing, let's let's figure out a way for us to kind of have some type of test test program for these for these programs that are existing, so we can be proactive, like Commissioner Musich said. So, thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, can you tell me more about how the transaction fee would work? Like, would it be triggered by GPS? Like, if they if they you know use their app while they're on parkland, but then just walk 10 feet and go on the road or something, would it not charge them? Uh, Chair Cogill, Com Commissioner Meyer, what, um, what we would envision, and we still need to work through the technology on this, on this piece, but what we would envision is being able to get records of those trips that start or end within the Minneapolis park system. So because they would be going to specific uh, virtual stations to either end or begin their trip, we should be able to gather that data from them, and then it would, we'd be look at that data to determine how, or how many transactions we can apply that, that to. If somebody's traveling through the park system and it doesn't start or end within the system, those would be things that we wouldn't be charging. Um, one thing I'm concerned about is this kind of patchwork of different regulations that different cities have. I think that will be discouraging to companies and, and confusing for users. Um, have you been working with other cities and maybe there's a way we could get it one united policy for the whole metro yeah um chair Cogill, commissioner meyer i'm glad you bring that up you know this conversation started about this time last year and there was been a kind of an urgent scramble to figure out kind of the right way to approach it and in that process one of the things we had considered is like a joint powers agreement between multiple cities or jurisdictions where we could collectively go forward and determine who the provider would be within within the region and while we couldn't get to that point in time for things to start rolling out and we couldn't get the level of agreement, many of the elected bodies also were in the middle of election during all this time as well. Uh, we anticipate restarting that conversation. And in fact, um, what, I, what uh, Robin at uh, Public Works has already initiated a week, is a, not a weekly, but a monthly meeting with St. Paul the U of M, the City of Minneapolis, and the Minneapolis Park Board, so we can start talking about what's the next, what's the next phase of this. Um, another one of her staff coordinates a regular meeting that pulls in the, uh, the other first ring suburbs as well. So there's some mechanisms in place. I think folks want to think through what the long-term strategy is. This is a strategy that would probably live through the life of the the, um, the license with nice ride motivate and then there'd be an opportunity to determine what that next step is. So I guess my, my thought on that is um, let's not sign any long-term agreements that would prevent us from, I don't know, changing in, in the near future to adapt to a metro-wide policy if, if we could come up with one. And, and more broadly speaking, I, I'm, I'm really excited about these new share programs. I think they're bringing uh, bikes and scooters to people who never used them before. Um, I want to encourage that however we can. I think there are some reasonable um, things that we can ask for, but I'm, I'm definitely apprehensive about a transaction fee. Like I, I want to um, encourage as many people to be using active transportation as possible. I think you know, it's appropriate to actively subsidize that. Um, yeah. So I, I, I would... Um, that's the one thing that I, I think I would oppose. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, President Bourne. Thank you, uh, Chair Colgill. Um, the I just wanted to uh, thank Deputy Superintendent Ringgold. Uh, this has been an issue that she has been on. Like, I think this was one of our very first conversations at the beginning of this year, um, and just kind of letting us all know that this is on the horizon and it's coming, and to actually have. Um, so often we react and we're not as proactive. And I see that we're in the steps of a proactive approach. Um, the And thanks to uh, Commissioner Meyer, I rode my first uh, bike share the, uh, the other day on a short trip with him. Um, the 
I, I did. I did have some questions about uh, about the fee structure too. That, that I get. I get a little bit nervous about a um, fee transaction going into going into parks, but uh, on on a few levels, I, I think it might be prove extremely onerous to audit. Um, and I, I think the, and I would also be a little bit nervous. I, I, I don't think that this would be the case, but, but if it's a per location transa transaction, the, the company would also have the ability to pass that cost on to their customers where, um, and almost create a disincentive to go through parks where if they, if they track that, like, Oh, we pay this once you enter onto this parkway. So we're going to charge that person. And then we want, we want bikes to be on our parkways. And so I, I, I almost wonder if a, you have a fleet of X size and almost like an annual fee per, per fleet. Cause there's not, if you take the totality of a year and a totality of those fleets, those tires are going to be spinning a lot on the many on Minneapolis Park Board trails, and maybe that's a way to just kind of structure it that would be easier on our end. You're only looking at one number. You have X bikes. It's it's X dollars, and and then that is passed on. Then there's not a uh, separation on a customer's transaction. Then so they can say, I pay this much to get this, and I can ride it wherever I want, and inclusion in the park board is just part of that so have we have we looked at a model that is that would operate like that or are we concerned about the auditing of where people go and when and just being able to keep track of that um uh commissioner colgill president born uh, let me let me first by recognizing transaction um, percentage might not be the right term because i realize what it's leading to is it's oh, starting sure. to sound like a toll or something that can be applied per usage and that's not the intent it would be more of a, on a monthly basis asking for records of how much revenue was generated um, from stations within the minneapolis park system not by biking through it and then as we would with any concessionaire within our system asking for a percentage of revenue so i, I want to make and I recognize that that still could go on to be passed to the customer, but I think any fee that we have could frankly be passed on to the customer. Uh, we have been comparing this idea to a flat fee to the fleet or a portion of the fleet. Um, so we'll continue to have, have those discussions. You know, This is new. We don't even know what the technology will fully allow us to do yet. That'll be a more detailed conversation with, um, with the permittee. Uh, but but we'll look we'll continue to look at that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, President Bourne, Commissioner Forney. Thank you for the um, presentation, Jennifer. Um, I got so many things written all over. Are we aware? I think a lot of people referred to. Um, a lot of the communities have done this. Do you know if anything statewide has ever been done as far as regulating? Um, Commissioner Colgill, or Chair Colgill, Commissioner Forney, I don't know for sure, but my understanding is this is, is what, what we are seeing happen in our region might be some of the first times we've done something to this to this scale to try to establish a license and, and regulate how this enters into the system. It's you know, the other day we sat down with Motivate and Lime and actually had a conversation of how they not not Lime Motivate and Nice Ride and how they would like to potentially roll this out in their system versus the night before dropping up and coming the next day and saying, hey, you've got 500 bikes, enjoy. Uh, so this is, this is kind of brown break, breaking work that we're doing. Um, that doesn't mean that there might not be something that would evolve to a regional or a state level in the future. Yeah, I guess that's where my mind is going. I mean, first of all, we are so unique in the sense that we have a separate park system. And where Dinah and St. Paul, whatever, it's within the city's governance and everything. And so how unique, you know, how do we play in set? So I appreciate that we're looking for a collaborative effort here. Um, do you know if Three Rivers has been invited to be a part of that? Uh, Chair Cogill, Commissioner Forney, I do know that Three Rivers has been approached by different companies wanting to place bikes within their system. 
Uh, I know that they have been at some of the meetings that we have that have the you know first, second ring suburbs engaged, but we're not to the point of having that conversation of a joint powers agreement with them at this yeah. point. And, and I guess I see that potentially that's where I would direct you know these groups to go, and 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 I'm feeling that you know something like this might be ending up with the state, um, and whether or not it's under. Transportation, or whether it's under recreation, I think could be a fascinating thing, and that I would hope that these companies somehow possibly could even document, you know, how much usage is recreation, how much usage is transportation, because there could be some funding sources in there to make it, I love it, the way, you know, equitable distribution, make it an equitable access for people. You're about to say something. Go ahead. Yeah. Well... Uh, perhaps one piece of information that would be interesting to the board is that um, this is moving rapidly and you know even now um, Motivate has been bought by Lyft so what you're seeing is that the major uh, kind of alternative car transportation providers are buying these uh, buying both the scooters as well as the uh, bike programs and putting them all under one umbrella. So both Lyft and Uber are actively purchasing them. So this is tr definitely coming under that shared transportation umbrella. And like I say, being that recreation is our strongest thing, you know, to know maybe whatever percentage it, I think yeah. would be helpful. Um, and then just a curious, does anybody know um, if somebody abandons a private bike in our system, who picks it up, and is there a charge for getting your bike back? Do you know anything? Uh, yes. Um, I'm looking to see if Jeremy is in there, and he is. But I might need to call on him depending on, on uh, how well I answer your question. Um, Chair Cogill, Commissioner Corney, so the policy we rely on in terms of articulating that this enterprise can't happen within the Minneapolis park system with uh, a permit with honor of policy is that you are not allowed to abandon objects within the Minneapolis park system. If you are, we retrieve them and we either try to reunite the owner with them or we eventually impound them and you would have to get them from the impound lot. So the, the primary piece here, whether it's private or enterprise, we will pick them up, we will eventually impound them, and you will need to retrieve it either directly from us or from, from an impound scenario. Um, and that is what we would be looking at in the case of the bikes that aren't either parked in the correct location or we, we don't have a, that the um, company doesn't have a permit with us. And I guess what I, as long as our policies are consistent, I guess is what's, you know, concern to me. Um, I, too, have concerns about scooters. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're being abandoned all over the place. <laughs> anyway, um, I think, oh, I, nope, I think I said it all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Forney. Uh, Council Rice, did you have a I mean, comment? just a quick point. I think that... Um, there's a lot of money involved in this stuff. Um, a lot of people have come in and they're going to start monetizing this operation for profit. Um, there's been a lot of uh, venture capital investment put in it. I think the question was asked about uh, thinking about it statewide. I think it's likely these uh, entities are probably going to the legislature next year and say prohibit local governments from regulating activity and just say let the market decide. It's free market. Here are the bikes. The public can ride them around and do what they want and take government regulation out of the picture. My mm. prediction. <laughs> Thank you, Council Rice. Um, with that, uh, I suppose I have a question for Council myself So, uh, regarding conflict of interest. So I am, for two more days, uh, employed at a company that is a consultant on this project, and I'm wondering if I... So I have no involvement if I can comment on my thoughts or not. Um, the, the company, uh, you're, you've disclosed the, your employer, correct? Correct. Yes. <coughs> and are you doing any work on this issue? No. Um, 
I don't, you, you disclose that, hey, but you're not working on this thing. No, I don't no. think you have a conflict. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, appreciate everybody's comments. I would just wanted to say a couple of things. I would encourage the thought of the station by station fee. I mean, if, if there are going to be a substantial number of um, stations, uh, dockless stations that are taking up space in our park system, uh, uh, and, and they may be you know, proposed for every single park, uh, that's, a, that's a lot of land. Um, you might see the stationless uh, stations already kind of being demarcated on city streets next to current um, nice ride uh, dock stations. Um, it's not a lot of space, but it, it's something. Um, and I think that the park board should be remunerated for that. Um, you know, we're looking at, what is it next year, 1,500 bikes. Um, the other uh, concern, just generally, I, I agree with Commissioner Meyer that we should be encouraging um, uh, shared mobility um, options for getting around the city, um, especially looking at the city's goals for reducing carbon emissions and reducing number of car trips. Um, these are all options for helping uh, us reach that goal. Um, but uh, I am aware of the concern that uh, has happened in other cities where uh, uh, one of these venture capital firms comes in with their new um, bike company, they run the nonprofit or original service out of business, and then they go bankrupt and they pick up all the bikes and throw them in a landfill. It's happened in Iowa, it's happened in Houston, um, and it's certainly not something that I would want to have happen in Minneapolis. Um, so um, the, it's great that we've been partnering um, so, so closely, but I, I am, I'm also concerned that I suppose thinking of this as something that we should subsidize. I, I don't know if that's the, the right approach. I think it's great that we're thinking about what fees we're going to be getting. Um, and um, I suppose finally the uh, transaction fee is something that also seems, seems thoughtful to me. So I think I have any other questions. Commissioner French. I was wondering what it would take for us to just operate our own system. I know that's a out of the out the box question, but what would it take for us to just purchase the bikes and put them where we wanted to put them at in our parks, and we collect whatever revenue is made from it? Thank you. I know it's pretty ambitious, but um, Chair uh, Cogill, uh, Commissioner French, I don't know for sure, um, and so I'll just I'll just say that, but. What we'd have to understand is that there's a there's a portion of the revenue that's sustaining this company moving forward that comes from the transaction um, for each use, and then there's all of the advertisement and the information that you have in the app that they're able to then benefit from uh, sponsors or other connections with other for-profit uh, ventures. So. I'm not certain how that business model works, but you'd have to not only have the folks who can recalibrate the bikes and, and move them and manage that part of it, but you'd also have to have someone who has that business enterprise who is going out and searching for those, the revenue coming from that, that found revenue source as well. Thank you, Commissioner French. I had one last question for uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold uh, that I forgot about. Um, what is our, have we had any thinking about what happens when a Lime bike from Edina ends up in our system? Would we be utilizing a similar contract <coughs> scenario? Uh, Chair Cogill, thank you for the question. We have, we have been thinking about that and certainly the city of Minneapolis in general has been, has been thinking about that. You know, we would be establishing that we have a, a permit process for a, a dockless bike share company to be entering the system. And if we indicate that they have to have a license to operate in the city of Minneapolis, it would effectively ensure that the folks who were operating in the Minneapolis park system were also licensed in the city of Minneapolis. So then we would be actively looking for ways to remove bikes that were not um, picked up. So if, if another company has a bike that gets that terminates within the Minneapolis park system, they will likely come pick it up because they can't actually start another trip from that area. If they don't, then we would be picking up those bikes, charging them a fee for returning it. 
Thank you. Yeah. With that, seeing no more questions, thank you, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold, thank for the you. presentation. Um, and I would take the motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, we are adjourned. I'd like to call the planning committee to order with a secretary. <laughs> Please call the roll. Commissioner French. Here. Commissioner Severson. Here. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Vice Chair Cogill. Here. Chair Forney. Here. You have a quorum. I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, September 5th. So moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Okay, we have an action item. Um, somebody would move that for me, please. I'll move resolution 2018-286. Um, um, resolution approving an encroachment permit for use of 29.5 square feet of land for a service sidewalk and 10 square feet of land for a stone retaining wall and denying an encroachment permit for use of 8.5 square feet of land for a concrete wall in front of the subject property at 1118 oh, um, Kenwood Parkway encroaching upon parkland at Kenwood Parkway and collecting appropriate fees associated with this encroachment. Thank you. Um, Christine, I, I guess I should ask first of all, people, would you like to have a presentation of this? Okay, all yes. right, Christine, you're up. Good evening, commissioners. You have before you this evening um, an encroachment permit application for Property located at 1118 Kenwood Parkway. And there are three elements to this encroachment application, encroachment permit application. You um, heard from two persons, I think, during open time regarding this encroachment permit, permit application. Um, the three elements that uh, are, regard, are, are referenced in the permit application are the sidewalk, the service sidewalk, the re stone, dry stone retaining wall, and then also the concrete wall in front of the property. So there are a number of pages in the addendum. I'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to take a look at those. Um, so I will try to open this. This is a little difficult to see on here, so maybe on your screen. We'll try to rotate some of these. Oh, that was not good there, sorry. So this first one is sort of a depiction of the um, proposed encroachment, and I'm sorry, these Photos tend to shrink and also without it. So uh, this PDF does some of the pages shrink and also and then also enlarge. So I was trying to explain that, but um, the first one shows the encroachment of the concrete wall. So I will say that. In the resolution there, you'll see that the first two elements, the retaining wall and also the service wide sidewalk, the, um, our, the staff is recommending approval. So the only thing that's really an issue here is the concrete wall. And you'll see that's where the address is here. And so I will try to scroll down and show you this first photo here. I'm sorry. Um, depiction is as L200 is really trying to show the property prior to the work that they have actually some of it has been completed. So this was the property, an overview of what the property was prior to the work. 
So at the time, and this is hard to see, I'm sorry, and I don't know if you had a chance to review it, there were encroachments at the time that were not permitted. Um, so there's a side, there was an existing sidewalk, and there was also a retaining wall that had a small, um, it was also encroaching by two, I think it was two and a half feet, and then 23 and a half square feet of private sidewalk that was encroaching on parkland. So, next page shows the proposed encroachments, which includes the 29 and a half square feet of sidewalk, which staff is a recommending approval. It's the service sidewalk from the public sidewalk to the home, and then also the retaining wall, which is the 10 and a half square feet, which we are, the 10 actually, 10 square feet that staff is recommending approval of. But then you'll see there's a concrete wall here. I don't know if it's easy to see my cursor um, that is stopped here on this particular screen, on this particular picture um, that is not encroaching, but they are requesting the eight and a half square feet to extend the concrete wall further out into parkland. So that's what's at issue, and that, that's what they, I believe, a lot of what they tried to address during the open time. Some of this is not necessarily helpful, so I'm gonna scroll past these pages. And this, um, I'm scrolling past some of our communications that are not really helpful at this time, but I'll show you some of the other depictions that might be helpful. So this photo, so I'll try to also enlarge. It's so my understanding is a photo of the property prior to the current work. And let's see. Like I said, this PDF is not really easy to navigate, but you can see there was a uh, stone wall at the time. There was also a sidewalk, and this is actually a photo, of my understanding. So you don't just have the, the aerial view of it and also the sidewalk. So those were existing at the time. And if I scroll down a little further, it's a very, much easier to see with a close up of the stone wall. This was existing, this is not currently in place. So, and that was the boulevard. So, the reason why staff is recommending a denial of the additional eight and a half square feet for the concrete wall is that it serves no functional purpose to the subject property and, and impacts the public's use and enjoyment of public land. One of the things I've probably talked with you a little earlier in, in the year when you first were sworn in as a board is the... Um, land policy that we have. And it is part of our encroachment permit application. I actually include it so that everyone who applies for an encroachment permit is clear as to what our, our policy is. So I'd like to just read it because I think it's helpful for everyone to sort of remember why we have this policy and why staff makes decisions as we do and make recommendations to the board. So it says the board strongly opposes diversion of park property by an individual, institution, or, or organization, public or private, for any purpose other than that for which the lands were acquired. Where proposed pro diversions of park property appear to be in the interest, best interest of the park system, or where all other alternatives have been exhausted, and only under these circumstances, requests will be taken under consideration by the board or an individual, on an individual basis. So, in the instance of the concrete wall, it serves no functional purpose. The retaining wall is to serve for grade, you know, retaining grade. The sidewalk, of course, is to serve, I'm sorry, I meant to keep that photo up there. Um, the retaining wall serves for retaining grade, of course, and the sidewalk is to serve for getting to the, to the residents. I'm sorry, <laughs> the PDF is always, Strange things, I just had it. Just one moment. There it is. So there it is. 
And so what is here in this depiction is showing, I believe the homeowner shows, where the wall, the extension of the wall is not necessary. It is basically there for aesthetics. And in that instance, it is not necessary. So they've shown where the wall, there is not, there's an alternative, and that is to shorten the wall and put an address on it. So back to the, the land policy, only under the, on, only under the conditions where all other, all, all other alternatives have been exhausted, and in, in the instance where it's necessary, can it be considered by the board? This is not necessary. The wall is not retaining grade. It's not serving any functional purpose. And um, in response, and just in dis the discussion regarding design and its usefulness and the beauty of a wall, that is really not our concern, I believe, given our policy. We need to consider why we are here and being stewards of parkland. Um, we cannot, at the expense of, expense of our land policy, uh, view the scope of all park users and their use of our parkland uh, and pit that against the, the individual taste of a, a homeowner. So we have to consider the park users against what would what be, be an aesthetic use of, of parkland. So that is why staff is recommending a denial of the eight and a half square feet. For the, issue, for the additional stone, the concrete wall that doesn't serve any, any functional purpose. Thank you, Commissioner Colville. Uh, yes, I had a question for the applicant, if possible, since he's here. Is that possible? Okay. Yeah. Chair, chair. Commissioner Forney, can I? Am I, or, or, am I able to ask a question of the applicant? Is that okay with the committee? Sure. Okay. Uh, you see, you had it, nodding. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm I'm wondering what is um, not what's the difficulty of moving the sign to the side of with the retaining wall that is allowed. So I I don't think it's the difficulty. I think the big picture is being missed. If you look at the property before, and and the job of being in parks is to kind of beautify the area. I used a landscape architect that did the sculpture garden, that did the gold medal park, and it's the same question of. Why did we need to make gold metal park? Why did we need the walls? Why did we need the hills? We could have just put flat grass. It was to make the area more beautiful, to, to appeal to our neighborhood. So I see the park board's property, not only in the parks, but in our neighborhoods as well. So we, that architecture firm said, we think this has the best value. Uh -huh. We absolutely can skip it. Right, okay, fantastic. That's my only question, I appreciate it. Okay. Anybody pressing anything? Okay, <laughs> President Warren. Uh, th thank you, Chair <laughs> Forney. I, I'm not a member of your committee. Um, I, I, uh, I'm sympathetic to the applicant's desire for the beautification of his property and uh, and surrounding property, but I, I think uh, I mean, the applicant's comment just on the record that 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 component can be skipped, uh, I think reinforces the board's obligation that we should uh, reaffirm staff's recommendation that it's not a requirement of the project and that the uh, policy, the policies and the uh, um, overriding goals of the park board would, would in this case compel us to to deny that request. So I would encourage the, uh, I would encourage the uh, committee to approve the staff recommendation. Mr. Severson. So I, I pulled this up on Google Maps. This basically looks a lot like the front yard that we're talking about, correct? Chair Forney, Commissioner Severson, yes, this is correct. I can also show you, uh, hopefully. So this isn't, my question in the meantime, this isn't space that we have people recreating in, correct? I mean, would you say that? I mean, this is just a walkable space. I and mean, this isn't a place where people are sitting down having a picnic, sitting down barbecuing, playing Frisbee. I mean, this, that, would that be a true statement? Yes, that would be so. But in all, in all instances, Parkland, regardless of whether we are having them picnic there, 
we are to preserve and, and apply land policy to all parkland. And this is a, a copy here of, of the Hennepin County map that shows, and this is probably an old photo. I'm assuming this may not be the right one. Yeah, it looks like the parcel 1118 Kenwood, and this area here in the front is what and where we're speaking of. So, I, I mean, I just, I, I get that and all, but I just find it real difficult. And I mean, we're absolutely stewards of this land, but I, I, I just find it really difficult that this is a space that we couldn't allow beautification or, you know, how we're supposed to move forward because it looks, I, I don't know, I'm just having a, a difficult time with your guys' recommendation on this. And I completely understand the policy and the importance of it, um, but we're, it appears that we're talking about people who are going to take care of the property. Uh, it looks like they had plant, natural plantings around it. I, I mean, I just find it difficult that we're going to hold somebody back on something minor. Maybe I have something to learn about this. I'm not sure, but I, I just wanted to express, you know, it seems a little uh, irrational, maybe, is the word I'm looking for. I, Chair Forney and Commissioner Severson, I would just Note and perhaps as real property administrator, I'm probably a little extreme in that that is sort of my job and that is to consider the land policy and to even to the point of eight and a half square feet. And I, I think in terms of being part of planning, um, I just my opinion, small, um, in doing community advisory councils, we are trying to observe the the opinions of many and not substituted for the opinion of one. So when we're being stewards of that parkland, we're not asking the opinion of a homeowner as to what's beautiful. And so if we are engaging a community action advisory committee for parks, why wouldn't we do the same thing for any other parkland? I mean, it just appears to me that this, this, the homeowners are um, stewards of this land. I mean, that, that's, that's a little bit how I see it, and I, I, it's not their property, obviously, at that point. But, I, I mean, like I said, I, I respect that wholeheartedly, and I think you're doing exactly, uh, mostly what you need to do with your job, absolutely correct. But just a little tough. Um, I, I just maybe disagree a little bit with the re recommendation. Any other comments? First of all, thank you for doing something tasteful. <laughs> uh, we do appreciate that, you know, uh, that, that is neighborly. Um, and also I have to say it, it is unfortunate that it, it sounds like you, shall we say, um, got misdirected initially. Um, uh, that's something that the city and ourselves need to be, you know, working on better to make sure that, you know, it's a more seamless process for you. Um, I appreciate that, you know, of all people that you chose Oslin because, you know, they do have a fine reputation, obviously, you know, we've used them before. I think, you know, one of the issues here um, is the fact that we need to be consistent and um, Joe Doe Landscaping could be the next one that approaches us and thinks this is aesthetically a benefit, you know, to the community and pink flamingos or, you know, whatever, right? You know, um, we are not here to judge, you know, the aesthetics of something, you know. I mean, we appreciate, okay, but um, we need to be consistent. And I think that's, you know, really, you know, what our policy is there is for us to be, you know, um, as I said, consistent. And um, this is an encroachment that um, isn't necessary. And that is really how we have to make our judgments. So we appreciate you, you know, wanting to um, make this more aesthetically pleasing to everybody. But um, in, in consistency with our policy, um, I would have to agree with staff that we need to deny um, your um, additional portion of the wall. So um, with that, all those in favor of the resolution as it stands, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Then we have next, and thank you also for attending. We appreciate that. Um, 
We have a um, study report, and I believe that Mr. Arvidsson is up again about the presentation of the draft North Service Area Master Plan. <coughs> Good evening, Chair Forney, Commissioners. Um, I am cognizant of the hour, um, so I don't want to scare you with the nearly 300-page document I'm going to present right now, um, because I won't go through it page by page, and I will try to be as efficient as I can. Um, this is a presentation that really comes based on our standard practice that we um, uh, release uh, a master plan for public comment, for 45-day comment, which you approved a week ago. And then at some point during that public comment period, I present to you the draft um, and sort of open the dialogue, answer questions, um, with the understanding that we are in the midst of a time when the community can weigh in on the plan once again. So the North Service Area Master Plan is a project that started uh, way back in January of 2017. Um, so we've been at it quite a while. Um, and now just released today is the draft uh, document um, available for public review. So tonight I'm going to go through really quickly what the approval process is for moving a large master plan like this. Um, I'm going to talk about the master plan itself. I'm not going to go through it page by page, like I said. And then I'm going to talk about ongoing input. So the way the master plan approval uh, uh, has, is working for the North Service Area Master Plan, on July 16th, the North Service Area Master Plan CAC made its recommendation on the plan. And based on that recommendation, we prepared the document around those recommendations. Um, on September 12th, the public comment period opened. Um, that was approved last week, and also on this same date, obviously I'm here before you to present the draft plan as is customary. The public comment period will close on October 27th. <clears throat> After that, we will tabulate the, uh, we'll tabulate the comment on the plan, um, and then modify the plan as appropriate, and bring it back to you for consideration for approval, and at that time there will be a, uh, a public hearing in the planning committee, and final consideration at the full board. So the North Service Area Master Plan, in parallel with the two other master plans that are already adopted, the South and the Downtown, has six sections. There's an introduction section, a planning process. We look at the service area vision, um, the neighborhood park plans, which is the big, huge part of it, an operations and maintenance chapter, and uh, implementation. So a service area master plan, as you may well know, is a project to create new park plans for all the outdoor facilities in neighborhood parks in a certain area. In this case, everything north of 394 and west of the river. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are 31 neighborhood park properties in the north service area, and we also looked at three regional trails, which are very inextricably linked uh, with the neighborhood park system um, and also don't have master plans. So this is what the north side looks like in terms of uh, those parks and how they are scattered around uh, the north side. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, we've been at this for about 18 months. And during that time period, we've had well more than 100 engagement events, including 10 CAC meetings, four community open houses, um, 15 uh, or more uh, work group meetings, which are uh, work groups were established out of the CAC as sort of community driven uh, groups that were looking at specific aspects of the plan. We also attended a whole lot of park events, community events, stakeholder meetings. Um, there was a lot going on. We contracted during the project with 11 community connectors who were north side residents, organizations, neighborhood groups, um, and we paid them to do engagement that was also brought into the process. We did an open studio time for the public during our design week when we generated the initial concepts. We invited the public to come into our studio and see things as sort of rough as it gets in terms of sketching. Um, and we also at that point hired a, um, a group of six additional landscape architects from across the country in order to ensure that there was um, some cultural diversity in our design team. So they came from uh, uh, Houston and Chicago and Pittsburgh um, and, uh, and sat with us and lived with us for a week and helped generate those design concepts. Throughout, obviously we did deliberate outreach to and engagement with people of color. Uh, the north side is the one sector um, that it has the, by far the largest percentage people of color um, throughout the city. So that was a, a very important aspect of that for us. So the planning process basically unfolded like this. We did a, a stage where we connected um, early with the community and began to establish a CAC. And then that led directly to the visioning and our phase one of engagement. 
Simultaneous to that, we were doing an inventory and analysis. So we were getting to learn the parks as we went through there. During this time, there was quite a bit of community engagement. We had three different CAC meetings. Um, we established work groups out of the CAC, which brought more community uh, into the process. Um, we uh, selected the community connectors and sent them out into the field, and we did our big summer of engagement. Um, and during the summer of 2017, uh, we were probably doing uh, an average of two to three events per week throughout that entire summer around the North Service Area Master Plan. All of that led to the creation of initial concepts. Um, and then we began the phase two engagement. And during that time, we had a fourth uh, CAC meeting where we did a data jam. So the community was helping us interpret the data, not just leaving it up to us. We had um, a design week, as I mentioned. Um, we had several open houses around the um, initial concepts, and the work groups met again. So there was, again, another round of that engagement. Based on all of that input, uh, we prepared preferred concepts and began our phase three engagement. There was a CAC sort of in the middle of those two things to really look at some guiding principles, and then actually four CACs that led to the final recommendation, and the work groups also met at that time. And where we are now is we're working on the mm -hmm. public comment and approvals. And just to yes. interrupt for a second, at the top it says South Service Area Master Plan. On all of them? No. No, just here. Just that one. Last line. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Well, now I, I just, I corrected it. I made the edit on this. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredibly responsive. Um, yeah. So I just want to highlight um, that uh, in the service area vision, which is the chapter where we look at the service area as a whole, um, we establish some guiding principles around the plan. And I just want to highlight a few of these, um, uh, just so you know kind of some of the things that guided us throughout and things that will guide the, the implementation of this plan. Uh, guiding principle number one is really about furthering the sense of pride in the north side through high quality parks. And doing so is recognizing, uh, sorry, recognizing that doing so is a question of racial equity because of those uh, demographic uh, factors that I told you about the north side before. So we really wanted to lead with that the idea around this is to continue to increase the pride in the north side. Hand in hand with that in principle number five, and I know that this has been discussed at the board level before, is that we do want to continue to work with partner agencies to minimize the possibility of displacement as these parks improve. We need to continue to study the effect of park development on local economic factors. We can recognize that parks are a contributor to higher property values, which can be beneficial if people are able to stay there. Um, and then we want to strive to make improvements that make people want to stay in their communities. So again, we don't have the final solutions to this whole question yet, but we want to recognize this as we move forward through the plan. So it does rise to the level of a guiding principle. Um, another guiding principle is to consider all age ranges in the design and development of parks. I highlight this in part because you've just recently adopted some uh, programmatic strategies around request, and this is an example of how some of these things are very much in line. So there is a focus on youth and also a focus on seniors embedded in this master planning effort also. Uh, this was one that was, um, that was really fascinating for me because it didn't come out as much in some of the other service area plans, but a real desire to create more opportunities for arts, music, and performance that reflect the north side community, whether that's programmed or just spontaneous in our parks. Um, and then also a desire to pr improve the park's environmental performance, and there were five specific techniques that were highlighted. So I want to highlight a few things that would be some area-wide amenity changes um, that came from the community and were um, uh, kind of coming up uh, that would be sort of changes or new things in the North Service area. We're looking at new kind of smaller splash, splash and spray plazas at three different parks where access to aquatics is fairly limited. Um, we also look at traditional play being complemented with adventure play and climbing at nine different parks. Um, a big slide at Farview, climbing at Hall Park, nature play at Shingle Creek, which is kind of a natural. Outdoor fitness stations at four parks, additional field space at eight different parks to create more space for um, football, uh, soccer, and other field sports that are growing in popularity. Um, new premier football and soccer fields at Harrison and North Commons with the possibility of a winter sports dome at North Commons. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Expanded basketball at 10 parks. Um, we heard this pretty loud and clear. Um, and then also the inclusion of CPAC Takra and pickleball courts at Shingle Creek and Creekview. Um, these are uh, games that are rising in popularity. I'm going to show some pictures of that in just a moment. Um, in addition, we're proposing refrigerated ice for skating and hockey at North Commons. 
some all-wheel parks and skate spots of various different scales at five parks, bicycle playgrounds at four parks, group shelters and gathering spaces, really big, really important on the north side. So we're looking at that for 15 parks and outdoor performance spaces, as I mentioned before, uh, fairly small scale, ad hoc at six parks, trail additions in most places so that we can get walking loops within those parks, and then urban agriculture sites in four places. So just really quickly, a couple of pictures. You can see here some of the alternative kind of play options. In the lower right is an adult fitness um, idea. There's some big slides here, just some visions. Um, pickleball is being played on the top two slides here. And then the bottom two is Sipak Takra, which if you haven't ever seen that played, I would suggest finding a YouTube video or something. These guys play volleyball with their feet. And it's pretty, guys and gals, I should say. It's pretty amazing. Um, and then uh, uh, is, in terms of the bike and the skating, here's a couple of different options that we look at incorporating. Um, it was interesting, I drove through the north side today delivering uh, service area master plans to the rec centers, and I noticed a group of kids on a sidewalk had built their own skate contraptions and were running up and down the sidewalk with their skateboards, uh, jumping over wood uh, things. So, um, One of the pieces that's also uh, important that we discussed with the CAC at length, length were the idea of these big moves. Um, so as things started to bubble up, there were a couple things that seemed bigger almost than just the park board. So we have guiding principle number 18, which is to implement significant park enhancements at four parks with the recognition that these would be programmatic financial and leadership partnerships with other agencies beyond us. They're beyond the scale of our budget and potentially wherewithal, but they were desired by the community, so these are gonna be bigger opportunities for us to look broader into the community. The places where these are envisioned is at Creekview, uh, where there's a real dearth of opportunities for dining and eating, and so that was a key idea there at Creekview. At Cleveland Park, there's a desire to expand that park out to Penn Avenue as part of a redevelopment of the Penn and Lowry intersection. Um, the city is actually on board with this, as is the community. Um, it would be a great vision for that particular park and neighborhood, which has some real challenges because of its placement in behind a bunch of houses. At North Commons, this is probably the largest one. We've talked about a multi-generational sports, arts, and community hub with an enhanced water park Premier Field and Winter uh, Activity Dome. And at Bryn Bar Meadows, um, the possibility of an all-weather conservatory-like building uh, that would have indoor play and basketball. So I want to talk about the park plans themselves. Um, I'm going to pivot into how the designs for each park look. So each park has its own park packet that can be sort of pulled apart and be standalone, almost like its own executive summary. The park plans, I'm just going to show, show Harrison for um, the, uh, the sake of picking one. So we have some location and history information, existing conditions information. We always have uh, an existing conditions image, as well as the proposed design itself. So this becomes the master plan, the concept plan. We do include a matrix that shows how we arrived at all of our decisions based on the different stages of engagement, um, a cost estimate for that park, and also a maintenance and operations estimate for that park. The overall operations and maintenance analysis is going to assist MPRB in identifying um, uh, how we get proper resources going forward as these things do get implemented. The analysis that we have here is based on methodology established in the South Service Area Master Plan. And by that analysis, we look at each facility and it, we assign sort of a maintenance differential to it. And I know at the bottom here, this looks like a very big number. Remember, this is at build out of a 30 year plan. So this is a very gradual increase. Um, uh, so that's where the maintenance goes. Um, implementation, and this is the last section I'll talk about. Um, uh, we look for accountability and transparency throughout, so there's some steps that we take to ensure that these master plans are followed. We really embed them digitally into our files, uh, we track them, and the document itself has guidance for how it should be used and amended. And then lastly, there's a few uh, notes I want to make on cost. Um, so the cost estimate was prepared for every single park, and some items to keep in mind, these are 2019 dollars. I did go ahead and escalate them to 2019, since most of the projects would initiate in that year. They include everything. These are sort of all-in costs. And the grand total is for a 30-year plan window. And it doesn't necessarily mean that all these costs will be borne by MPRB. There's always partnerships and outside money that could come to it. Um, 
that's tiny because I want to expand it on the next page and talk about a comparison really. We've done now three of these, either adopted or in draft form. And it's interesting to look at cost per acre for park development. In 2019 dollars, the South Service Area Master Plan proposed about a $320,000 cost per acre. Downtown was more. Keep in mind, we're working from absolute scratch there in downtown, so it's higher. And North sits somewhere in between. Master plans are aspirational. If we designed, in my opinion, just to the money we have, we'd be selling ourselves short because there's always the ability to bring money in from outside by inspiring um, the opportunity for grants, philanthropic funding, partnerships, who knows what. So we do want to be aspirational, but not unrealistically so. So I looked at the combined cost, per acre cost, of South, Downtown, and North, um, those plans that we're essentially complete with for the most part, and the per acre cost for improvement is $358,000, which interestingly, you'll note is almost exactly what North is, so that's right in the middle of the road. Remember that these are 30-year plans, so if we just take the 20-year NPP uh, 20 as our main funding source for this, mm -hmm. and if we normalize against the 30-year, so if we either assume that NPP 20 is going to go for another 10, or if we shrink our budget by, two, by a third, um, then what happens is that NPP 20 would actually fund 70% of these improvements wow. system-wide. So clearly a gap, clearly aspirational, uh, but not completely out of the realm of possibility. Ongoing input, um, the public can comment online or at any North Service Area Recreation Center or here at headquarters until October 27th. The SurveyMonkey uh, uh, link is right there. You can do an online survey. We also have printed surveys. After the comment period closes, as I mentioned, we will tabulate staff comments and we'll come back to you in a public hearing to request adoption of the plan. And I will open for questions. Good. I'm glad to see that we got a question. Okay. Commissioner uh, Person. Um, first question. Uh, can you go more into specifics about this dome? Because this has been a quite uh, contentious conversation and debate. Maybe I'll say a robust debate robust. <laughs> that has taken place. And um, I don't think uh, any of us will win on this one. It's, uh, it seems to be di divided in the community 50-50. Um, yes, Chair, Chair Corny, Commissioner Severson, I, I think that's a very accurate uh, depiction um, of what we're hearing. And this was one of the more difficult decisions for the design team uh, to bring forward. Um, the plan at North Commons is a significant change from today's North Commons. Um, the basic uh, plan idea, um, I can pull it up on the screen while I talk. The basic idea is to create a new, different kind of center that would actually connect the aquatic access with the athletic access um, and also create a fairly significant community gathering space on the inside, which was um, all of which were very uh, heavily desired. Where am I, Ryan? Wait. As we began to move through this process, here it is. So over here, you can see a different building, a different arrangement of these facilities. The main, uh, the main goal of this preferred plan was to address community desires that we're hearing, um, which included a desire for a lot more opportunities for sports and arts indoors, um, higher quality facilities, but also to make sure that the park could retain some of its pastoral wooded character. So right now, North Commons Park is kind of divided almost in half with the northern end over here being home to our water park and our rec center and our parking lot and the fields. And the southern half is very heavily wooded with some significant landmark trees. So we've essentially preserved that division. We've left the southern half mostly as it is. And then the northern half we've done, yes, an even more aggressive development than it is, th than is there today. Some of the advantages of this is that by bringing sort of the uh, sports and the aquatics into one building with the rec center, um, which it is not today, they're two separate buildings. There's more opportunity for points of contact uh, with, um, uh, with uh, youth leaders, um, no matter what's happening on the site. Um, and it also provides a, um, a year-round indoor activity. 
um, both within the building, within the larger building, and also uh, on the field if it were domed in winter. So the dome itself has been, as Commissioner Stevenson correctly uh, relates, that's really been the point that's been contentious in the community. Um, we have heard a real desire for having these kinds of facilities in general. Um, there's been uh, significant concern with having it here um, at North Commons, primarily related to the potential size and scale of it. Um, and those concerns have been raised by uh, uh, adjacent uh, homeowners uh, primarily. Um, this isn't a dome that would be up all year round, um, but it would <coughs> provide sports space and event space uh, in the winter, which is not uh, something currently available on the north side, really. Uh, I wanted to share too with other commissioners, there's valid concerns about not having a baseball field any longer and also not having tennis courts. Um, so then we're many of the conversations that were had uh, between community members. I also want to share, um, what, can, you do, have, can I ask you before I go there about the cut through at Farview Park? Uh, Commissioner Stevens said the, the cut through at Be Farview Park? Uh, so they, something about cutting through the hill was a conversation that a lot of folks yep. were... Uh, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. so Chair, Chair Forney, Commissioner Severson, um, at, at Farview there's been con some concern about the proposal to have an accessible pathway um, that would go to the top of the Farview Hill. Um, uh, our vision for that pathway would be that it would be a 5% accessible slope <coughs> that would allow all users to, be to get to the top of the hill. And that would be aligned um, on the side of the hill that isn't currently used for sledding, so it wouldn't interrupt that use at all. I think there was um, a feeling among the design team and then ultimately a feeling among the CAC that that accessibility should be provided. I do understand that that has been another point of discussion uh, in, in the community about that particular item. Um, do we have the printed surveys in these parks? The pr Commissioner Severson, the printed surveys of community input? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we, yes? Okay. I can make those available to you. All right, and then I just... I, I oh, yeah, think, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yes, the printed surveys are at the... Re I thought you meant engagement from before. Commissioner Severson, the printed surveys are available to be taken at all the rec centers. Great. Um, so I, I think you guys did a really phenomenal job, and you did a great balancing act with uh, <laughs> quite a few interesting community members. But I do want to share um, just a few things that was uh, were very disappointing, particularly to, for a few women that I had discussions with. And they said they felt um, a lot of mansplaining took place with the leadership of the actual CAC itself. Um, I was really excited to hear or to see both Londell and our Commissioner uh, French and Commissioner Forney come down to Farview Park and, and also North Commons Park to have conversations with some of these folks. And I just, you know, I want to reiterate that we really want to be inclusive and we want to make sure that everybody is heard and has an opportunity to speak. Um, and a lot of folks in, in, this, um, in this process did not feel heard. Uh, they, they didn't feel validated and they felt like their time was wasted. Um, so I, I, like I said, I really want to express uh, my appreciation to you, but I also want us to figure out a way to be better uh, in the future so that all community members are heard and feel like uh, they have just as much input as the next. Okay, Commissioner Cogill. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I just want to say, uh, just looking at how much engagement was done is really impressive, and I love to see the um, wide array of proposed um, uses, park uses, from just all of it, from the pickleball to the to um, the workout stations. Just really fantastic. So, thanks a lot for the presentation. Other questions? Oh, okay. Um, just a clarification. You you commented about um, wherever it was anyway. Skate spots. Were you talking about ice or board? Um, uh, Chair Forney, that's uh, for board and or bike. So these are okay. very small, um, designed kind of trick spaces that might be along a linear pathway. Um, so not a full blown bike board park, but little elements uh, kind of incorporated within a kind of a pathway system. But it, it, it's not a winter activity. It is for bikes and boards. Okay. And it just, whether or not in the whatever draft, whether or not that's clear for people. Okay. Um, 
And awesome. I love your analogy or analysis, I should say, um, of the three service area plans and the um, costs. Um, I think that's, that's wonderful for us to have as far as, you know, our planning. And I appreciate also you putting in the terms of these are aspirational and, and yet at the same time not um, unrealistic. So um, once again, Adam, you do a brilliant job, and I appreciate it. So thank you very much, and staff, and our consultants. So with that, um, if there's no other questions, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. I would like to call to order the uh, Committee of the Whole of uh, September 12th, uh, 2018. If Secretary Ringel would please take the roll. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Cogill. Present. Commissioner Severson. Here. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Commissioner French. Here. Commissioner Forney. Here. Vice President Hassan. Here. President Bourne. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? <coughs> second. And it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The agenda carries. I would entertain a motion to enter into closed session for uh, receiving a litigation update. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? We are in closed session. If we can adjourn to the next room.